Introduction to The Duchess of Malfi. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Duchess of Malfi by John Webster. Introductory note: Of John Webster's life, almost nothing is known. The dates, fifteen eighty to 1625 given for his birth and death are conjectural inferences about which the best that can be said is that no known facts contradict them the first notice of webster so far discovered shows that he was collaborating in the production of plays for the theatrical manager henslow in 1602 and of such collaboration he seems to have done a considerable amount four plays exist which he wrote alone the white devil the duchess of malfi the devil's law case and appius and virginia the duchess of malfi was published in sixteen twenty three but the date of writing may have been as early as sixteen eleven it is based on a story in painter's palace of pleasure translated from the italian novelist bandello and it is entirely possible that it has a foundation in fact. In any case, it portrays with a terrible vividness one side of the court life of the Italian Renaissance, and its picture of the fierce quest of pleasure, the recklessness of crime, and the worldliness of the great princes of the church finds only too ready corroboration in the annals of the time. Webster's tragedies come toward the close of the great series of tragedies of blood and revenge in which the Spanish tragedy and Hamlet are landmarks, but before decadence can fairly be said to have set in. He, indeed, loads his scene with horrors almost past the point which modern taste can bear, but the intensity of his dramatic situations and his superb power of flashing in a single line a light into the recesses of the human heart at the crises of supreme emotion redeems him from mere sensationalism and places his best things in the first rank of dramatic writing dramatis personae ferdinand read by m b cardinal read by matt jones antonio read by martin geeson dalio read by andy minter Bosola, read by David Nicol. Castruccio, read by Bologna Times. Pescara, read by Kim Stish. Malatesti, played by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Roderigo, read by David Muncaster. Silvio, read by Losh Rolando. Grizzolan, read by Miriam Esther Goldman. Doctor. Read by Hevid. First Madman. Read by Lucy Perry. Second Madman. Read by Barry Eads. Third Madman. Read by Hevid. The Fourth Madman. Played by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Duchess of Malfi. Read by Elizabeth Clett. Cariola. Read by Ariel Lipshaw. Julia. Read by Barony. Old Lady, read by Storm. First Pilgrim, read by Lucy Perry. Second Pilgrim, read by Barry Eads. First Servant, read by Daniel Hutton. Executioner, read by Grace Godwin. Other roles played by members of the company, and narrated by Bologna Times. End of Introductory Note Act One of the Duchess of Malfi. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Duchess of Malfi by John Webster. Act One, Scene One. Enter Antonio and Delio. You are welcome to your country, dear Antonio. You have been long in France. And you return a very formal Frenchman in your habit. 
How do you like the French court? I admire it. In seeking to reduce both state and people to a fixed order, their judicious king begins at home, quits first his royal palace of flattering sycophants, of dissolute and infamous persons, which he sweetly terms his master's masterpiece, the work of heaven, considering duly that a prince's court is like a common fountain, whence should flow pure silver drops in general. But if to chance some cursed example poison it near the head, death and diseases through the whole land spread. And what is to makes this blessed government but a most provident council, who dare freely inform him the corruption of the times? Though some of the court hold it presumption to instruct princes what they ought to do, it is a noble duty to inform them what they ought to foresee. Here comes Bossola, the only court Gaul. Yet I observe his railing is not for simple love of piety. Indeed he rails at those things which he wants, would be as lecherous, covetous, or proud, bloody, or envious as any man, if he had means to be so. Here's the cardinal. Enter cardinal and Bossola. I do haunt you still. So? I've done you better service than to be slighted thus. Miserable age, where the only reward of doing well is the doing of it. You enforce your merit too much. I fell into the galleys in your service, where, for two years together, I wore two towels instead of a shirt, with a knot on the shoulder after the fashion of a Roman mantle. Slighted thus, I will thrive some. Blackbirds fatten best in hard weather. Why not I in these dog days? Would you could become honest. With all your divinity, do not direct me the way to it. I've known many travel far for it, and yet return as arrant knaves as they went forth, because they carried themselves always along with them. Exit. Cardinal. Are you gone? Some fellows, they say, are possessed with the devil. But this great fellow were able to possess the greatest devil, and make him worse. He hath denied thee some suit. He and his brother are like plum trees that grow crooked over standing pools. They're rich and overladen with fruit, but none but crows, pies, and caterpillars feed on them. Could I be one of their flattering pandas, I would hang on their ears like a horse leech till I were full, and then drop off. I pray leave me. Who would rely upon these miserable dependencies in expectation to be advanced to-morrow? What creature ever fed worse than hoping Tantalus? Nor ever died any man more fearfully than he that hoped for a pardon? There are rewards for hawks and dogs when they've done a service, but for a soldier that hazards his limbs in a battle, nothing but a kind of geometry is his last supportation. Geometry? Ay, to hang in a fair pair of slings, take his latter swing in the world upon an honourable pair of crutches, from hospital to hospital. Fare ye well, sir, and yet do not you scorn us, for places in the court are but like beds in the hospital, where this man's head lies at that man's foot, and so lower and lower. Exit. I knew this fellow. Seven years in the galleys for a notorious murder, and twas thought the cardinal suborned it. He was released by the French general, Gaston de Foix, when he recovered Naples. It is great pity he should be thus neglected. I have heard he's very valiant. This foul melancholy will poison all his goodness. For I'll tell you, if too immoderate sleep be truly said to be an inward rust unto the soul, it then doth follow want of action breeds all black malcontents, and their close rearing, like moths in cloth, do hurt for want of wearing. Scene two. Antonio and Delio. Enter. Silvio, Castruccio, Julia, Rodrigo, and Grisolan. The presence gins to fill. You promised me to make me the partaker of the natures of some of your great courtiers. The Lord Cardinals, and other strangers that are now in court, I shall. Here comes the great Calabrian Duke. Enter Ferdinand and attendants. Hoot! 
took the ring oftenest? Antonio Bologna, my lord. Our sister Duchess is great master of her household. Give him the jewel. When shall we leave this sportive action and fall to action indeed? Methinks, my lord, you should not desire to go to war in person. Now for some gravity. Why, my lord? It is fitting for a soldier arise to be a prince, but not necessary a prince to send to be a captain. No? No, my lord. He were far better do it by a deputy. Why should he not as well sleep or eat by a deputy? This might take idle, offensive, and base office from him, whereas the other deprives him of honor. Believe my experience. That realm is never long and quiet, where the ruler is a soldier. Thou toldst me thy wife could not endure fighting. True, my lord. And of a jest she broke, of a captain she met full of wounds. <laughs> I have forgot it. She told him, my lord, he was a pitiful fellow to lie, like the children of Ismail, all in tents. Why, there's a wit were able to undo all the chirurgeons of the city. For although Galantz should quarrel and had drawn their weapons and were ready to go to it, yet her persuasions would make them put up. That she would, my lord. How do you like my Spanish genet? He is all fire. I am of Pliny's opinion. I think he was begot by the wind. He runs as if he were ballast with quicksilver. True, my lord. He reads from the tilt often. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you laugh? Methinks you that our courtiers should be my touchwood. Take fire when I give fire. That is, laugh when I laugh. With a subject never so witty. True, my lord. I myself have heard a very good jest, and have scorned to seem to have so silly a wit as to understand it. But I can laugh at your fool, my lord. He cannot speak. But he makes faces. My lady cannot abide him. No. Nor endure to be in merry company, for she says too much laughing and too much company fills her too full of the wrinkle. I would then have a mathematical instrument made for her face that she should not laugh out of compass. I shall shortly visit you at Millen, Lord Silvio. Your grace shall arrive most welcome. You are a good horseman, Antonio. You have excellent riders in France. What do you think of good horsemanship? Nobly, my lord. As out of the Grecian horse issued many famous princes, so out of brave horsemanship arise the first sparks of growing resolution that raise the mind to noble action. You have bespoke it worthily. Your brother, the Lord Cardinal, and Sister Duchess. Enter Cardinal with Duchess and Cariola. Are the galleys come about? They are, my lord. Here's the Lord Silvio is come to take his leave. Now, sir, your promise. What's that Cardinal? I mean, his temper. They say he's a brave fellow, will play his five thousand crowns at tennis, dance, court ladies, and one that hath fought single combats. Some such flashes superficially hang on him for form, but observe his inward character. He is a melancholy churchman. The spring in his face is nothing but the engendering of toads. Where he is jealous of any man, he lays worse plots for them than ever was imposed on Hercules, for he strews in his way flatterers, panders, intelligences, atheists, and a thousand such political monsters. He should have been Pope, but instead of coming to it by the primitive decency of the Church, he did bestow bribes so largely and so impudently, as if he would have carried it away without heaven's knowledge. Some good he hath done. You have given too much of him. What's his brother? The Duke there, a most perverse and turbulent nature. What appears in him mirth is merely outside. If he laughed heartily... It is to laugh all honesty out of fashion. Twins? In quality. He speaks with others' tongues, and hears men's suits with others' ears. 
will seem to sleep at the bench, only to entrap offenders in their answers, dooms men to death by information, rewards by hearsay. Then the law to him is like a foul black cobweb to a spider. He makes it his dwelling, and a prison to entangle those shall feed him. Most true. He never pays debts unless they be shrewd turns, and those he will confess that he doth owe. Last for this brother there, the cardinal, they that do flatter him most say oracles hang at his lips, and verily I believe them, for the devil speaks in them. But for their sister, the right noble duchess, you never fixed your eye on the three fair medals cast in one figure of so different temper. For her discourse, it is so full of rapture, you will only begin then to be sorry when she doth end her speech, and wish in wonder she held it less vain glory to talk much than your penance to hear her. Whilst she speaks, she throws upon a man so sweet a look that it were able to raise one to a galliard that lay in a dead palsy, and to dote on that sweet countenance. But in that look there speaketh so divine a continence, as cuts off all lascivious and vain hope. Her days are practised in such noble virtue, that sure her nights, nay more her very sleeps, are more in heaven than other ladies' shrifts. Let all sweet ladies break their flattering glasses, and dress themselves in her. <laughs> Fie, Antonio! You play the wire-drawer with her commendations. I'll case the picture up, only thus much. All her particular worth grows to this sum. She stains the time past, lights the time to come. You must attend my lady in the gallery, some half an hour hence. I shall. Excellent. Antonio and Delio. Sister, I have a suit to you. To me, sir? A gentleman here, Daniel de Bozzola, one that was in the galleys. Yes, I know him. A worthy fellow he is. Pray, let me entreat for the provisorship of your horse. Your knowledge of him commends him and prefers him. Call him hither. Exit, attendant. We are now upon parting. Good Lord Silvio, do us commend to all our noble friends at the leaguer. Sir, I shall. You are for Milan? I am. Bring the carosh. We'll bring you down to the haven. Excellent Duchess Silvio, Castruccio, Rodrigo, Grisolan, Cariola, Julia, and attendants. Be sure you entertain that Basila for your intelligence. I would not be seen in it. And therefore many times have I slighted him when he did court our furtherance, as this morning. Antonio, the great master of her household, had been far fitter. You are deceived in him. His nature is too honest for such business. He comes. I'll leave you. Exit. Re-enter Basola. I was lured to you. My brother here, the cardinal, could never abide you. Never since he was in my debt. Maybe some oblique character in your face made him suspect you? Does he study physiognomy? There's no more credit to be given to the face than to a sick man's urine, which some call the physician's whore, because she cousins him. He did suspect me wrongfully. For that you must give great men leave to take their times. Distrust does cause us seldom be deceived. You see the oft shaking of the cedar tree fastens it more at root. Yet take heed. For to suspect a friend unworthily instructs him the next way to suspect you, and prompts him to deceive you. There's gold. So, what follows? Aside. Never rain such showers as these without thunderbolts in the tail of them. Whose throat must I cut? <laughs> Your inclination to shed blood rides post before my occasion to use you. I give you that to live in the court here and observe the duchess, to note all the particulars of her haviour, what suitors do solicit her for marriage and whom she best affects. She's a young widow, I would not have her marry again. No, sir. Do not you ask the reason. 
but be satisfied. I say I would not. It seems you would create me one of your familiars. Familiar? What's that? Why, a very quaint, invisible devil in flesh. An intelligencer. Such a kind of thriving thing I would wish thee. And ere long thou mayst arrive at a higher place by it. Take your devils, which hell calls angels. These cursed gifts would make you a corrupter, me an impudent traitor. And should I take these, they'd take me to hell. Sir, I'll take nothing from you that I have given. There is a place I procured for you this morning, the provisorship of the horse. Have you heard, aunt? No. Tis yours. Is not worth thanks? I would have you curse yourself now, that your bounty, which makes men truly noble, e'er should make me a villain. Oh, that to avoid ingratitude for the good deed you have done me, I must do all the ill man can invent. Thus the devil candies all sins o'er, and what heaven terms vile, that names he complimental. Be yourself, keep your old garb of melancholy, twill express you envy those that stand above your reach, yet strive not to come near em. This will gain access to private lodgings, where yourself may, like a politic dormouse, as I have seen some feed in a lord's dish, half asleep, not seeming to listen to any talk, and yet these rogues have cut his throat in a dream. What's my place? The provisorship of the horse. Say then, my corruption grew out of horse dung. I am your creature. Away! Exit. Let good men, for good deeds, covet good fame, since place and riches oft are bribes of shame. Sometimes the devil doth preach. Exit. Scene three. Enter Ferdinand, Duchess, Cardinal, and Cariola. We are to part from you, and your own discretion must now be your director. You are a widow. You know already what man is, and therefore let not youth, high promotion, eloquence. No, nor anything without the addition, honor, sway your high blood. Mary, they are most luxurious, will wed twice. Ah, oh, fie! Their livers are more spotted than Laban's sheep. Diamonds are of most value, they say, that have passed through most jewellers' hands. Whores by that rule are precious. Will you hear me? I'll never marry. So most widows say, but commonly that motion lasts no longer than the turning of an hourglass. The funeral sermon and it end both together. Now hear me. You live in a rank pasture here at the court. There's a kind of honeydew that's deadly. Twill poison your fame. Look to it. Be not cunning, for they whose faces do belie their hearts are witches ere they arrive at twenty years. I am give the devil suck. This is terrible good counsel. Hypocrisy is woven of a fine small thread, subtler than Vulcan's engine. Yet believe it, your darkest actions, nay, your privatest thoughts, will come to light. You may flatter yourself, and take your own choice. Privately be married under the eaves of night. Make it the best voyage that e'er you made, like the irregular crab, which, though it goes backwards, thinks that it goes right, because it goes its own way. But observe, such weddings may more properly be said to be executed than celebrated. The marriage night is the entrance into some prison. Those joys, those lustful pleasures, are like heavy sleeps which do forerun man's mischief. Fare you well. Wisdom begins at the end. Remember it. Exit. I think this speech between you both was studied. It came so roundly off. You are my sister. This was my father's poniard. Do you see? I'd be loath to see it look rusty, cause twas his. I would have you to give o'er these chargeable revels. A visor and a mask are whispering rooms that were never built for goodness. Fare ye well. 
and beware the part which like the lamprey hath never a bone in't fie sir nay i mean the tongue variety of courtship what cannot a neat knave with a smooth tail make a woman believe farewell lusty widow exit shall this move me if all my royal kindred lay in my way unto this marriage i'd make them my low footsteps and even now even in this hate as men in some great battles by apprehending danger have achieved almost impossible actions i have heard soldiers say so so i through frights and threatenings will assay this dangerous venture let old wives report i winked and chose a husband cariola to thy known secrecy i have given up more than my life my fame both shall be safe for i'll conceal this secret from the world as warily as those that trade in poison keep poison from their children thy protestation is ingenious and hearty i believe it is antonio come he attends you good dear soul leave me but place thyself behind the arras where thou mayst overhear us wish me good speed for i am going into a wilderness where i shall find nor path nor friendly clue to be my guide cariola goes behind the arras enter antonio i sent for you sit down take pen and ink and write are you ready yes what did i say that i should write somewhat oh i remember after these triumphs and this large expense it's fit like a thrifty husband we inquire what's laid up for to-morrow so please your beauteous excellence beauteous indeed i thank you i look young for your sake you have ta'en my cares upon you i'll fetch your grace the particulars of your revenue and expense oh you are an upright treasurer but you mistook for when i said i meant to make inquiry what's laid up for to-morrow i did mean what's laid up yonder for me where in heaven i am making my will as tis fit princes should in perfect memory and i pray sir tell me were not one better make it smiling thus than in deep groans and terrible ghastly looks as if the gifts we parted with procured that violent distraction oh much better if i had a husband now this care were quit but i intend to make you overseer what good deed shall we first remember say begin with that first good deed begun i the world after man's creation the sacrament of marriage i'd have you first provide for a good husband give him all all yes your excellent self in a winding sheet in a couple saint winifred that were a strange will twere stranger if there were no will in you to marry again what do you think of marriage i take it as those that deny purgatory it locally contains or heaven or hell there's no third place in't how do you affect it my banishment feeding my melancholy would often reason thus pray let's hear it say a man never marry nor have children what takes that from him only the bare name of being a father or the weak delight to see the little wanton ride a cock horse upon a painted stick or hear him chatter like a taut starling fie fie what's all this one of your eyes is bloodshot use my ring to it they say it is very sovereign twas my wedding ring and i did vow never to part with it but to my second husband you have parted with it now yes to help your eyesight you have made me stark blind how there is a saucy and ambitious devil is dancing in this circle remove him how there needs small conjuration when your finger may do it thus is it fit 
She puts the ring upon his finger. He kneels. What said you? Sir, this goodly roof of yours is too low built. I cannot stand upright in it, nor discourse, without I raise it higher. Raise yourself. Or, if you please, my hand to help you. So. Raises him. Ambition, madam, is a great man's madness, that is not kept in chains and close-pent rooms, but in fair lightsome lodgings, and is girt with the wild noise of prattling visitants, which makes it lunatic beyond all cure. Conceive not I am so stupid, but I aim where to your favours tend, but he's a fool that, being a cold, would thrust his hands in the fire to warm them. So now the ground's broke, you may discover what a wealthy mine I make your lord of. Oh, my unworthiness! You were ill to sell yourself. This darkening of your worth is not like that which tradesmen use in the city. Their false lights are to rid bad wares off. And I must tell you, if you will know where breathes a complete man, I speak it without flattery, turn your eyes and progress through yourself. Were there nor heaven nor hell, I should be honest. I have long served virtue, and ne'er tain wages of her. Now she pays it. <laughs> the misery of us that are born great. We are forced to woo, because none dare woo us. And as a tyrant doubles with his words, and fearfully equivocates, so we are forced to express our violent passions in riddles and in dreams and leave the path of simple virtue, which was never made to seem the thing it is not. Go, go, brag, you have left me heartless. Mine is in your bosom. I hope to multiply love there. You do tremble. Make not your heart so dead a piece of flesh to fear more than to love me. Sir, be confident. What is distracts you? This is flesh and blood, sir. Tis not the figure cut in alabaster kneels at my husband's tomb. Awake, awake, man! I do here put off all vain ceremony, and only do appear to you a young widow that claims you for her husband. And, like a widow, I use but half a blush and— Truth speak for me. I will remain the constant sanctuary of your good name. I thank you, gentle love, and cause you shall not come to me in debt, being now my steward. Here upon your lips I sign your quietus est. This you should have begged now. I have seen children oft eat sweetmeats thus, as fearful to devour them too soon. But for your brothers— do not think of them. All discord without this circumference is only to be pitied and not feared. Yet, should they know it, time will easily scatter the tempest. These words should be mine, and all the parts you have spoke, if some part of it would not have savoured flattery. Kneel. Cariola comes from behind the arras. Ah! Be not amazed. This woman's of my counsel. I have heard lawyers say, a contract in a chamber, per verba de presenti, is absolute marriage. She and Antonio kneel. Bless heaven, this sacred Gordian, which let violence never untwine. And may our sweet affections, like the spheres, be still in motion. Quickening, and make the like soft music that we may imitate the loving palms, best emblem of a peaceful marriage, that never bore fruit divided. What can the church force more? That fortune may not know an accident either of joy or sorrow to divide our fixed wishes. How can the church build faster? We are now man and wife, and tis the church that must but echo this. Maid, stand apart. I now am blind. What's your conceit in this? I would have you lead your fortune by the hand unto your marriage-bed. You speak in me this, for we are now one. We'll only lie and talk together, and plot to appease my humorous kindred. 
and if you please, like the old tale in Alexander and Lodowick, lay a naked sword between us, keep us chaste. Oh, let me shroud my blushes in your bosom, since tis the treasury of all my secrets. Exeunt, Duchess, and Antonio. Whether the spirit of greatness or of woman reign most in her, I know not. But it shows a fearful madness. I owe her much of pity. Exit. End of Act One. Act Two of the Duchess of Malfi. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Duchess of Malfi by John Webster. Act Two, Scene One. Enter Basola and Castruccio. You say you would fain be taken for an eminent courtier. "'Tis the very main of my ambition. "'Let me see. Uh, "'You have a reasonable good face for it already, "'and your nightcap expresses your ears sufficient largely. "'I would have you learn to twirl the strings of your band with a good grace, "'and, in a set speech, at the end of every sentence, "'to hum three or four times, "'or blow your nose till it smart again to recover your memory. "'When you come to be a precedent in criminal causes, if you smile upon a prisoner, hang him. But if you frown upon him and threaten him, let him be sure to escape the gallows. I would be a very merry president. Do not sup a night's. It will beget you an admirable wit. Rather, it would make me have a good stomach to quarrel. For they say, your roaring boys eat meat seldom, and that makes them so valiant. But how shall I know whether the people take me for an eminent fellow? I will teach a trick to know it. Give out you lie a-dying, and if you hear the common people curse you, be sure you are taken for one of their prime nightcaps. Enter an old lady. You come from painting now. From what? Well, from your scurvy face physic. To behold thee not painted inclines somewhat near a miracle. These in thy face here were deep ruts and foul sloughs the last progress. There was a lady in France that, having had the smallpox, flayed the skin off her face to make it more level, and whereas before she looked like a nutmeg grater, after she resembled an abortive hedgehog. Do you call this painting? No, no, but you call it careening of an old morphewed lady to make her disembogue again. There's a rough-cast phrase to your plastic. It seems you are well acquainted with my closet. One would suspect it for a shop of witchcraft, to find in it the fat of serpents, spawn of snakes, Jews' spittle and their young children's ordure, and all of these for their face. I would sooner eat a dead pigeon taken from the soles of the feet of one sick of the plague than kiss one of you fasting. Here are two of you, whose sin of your youth is the very patrimony of the physician, makes him renew his footcloth with the spring and change his high-priced courtesan with the fall of the leaf. I do wonder you do not loathe yourselves. Observe my meditation now. What thing is in this outward form of man to be beloved? We account it ominous if nature do produce a colt or lamb, a fawn or goat in any limb resembling a man, and fly from it as a prodigy. Man stands amazed to see his deformity in any other creature but himself. But in our own flesh, Though we bear diseases which have their true names only tamed from beasts, as uh, the most ulcerous wolf and swinish measle, though we are eaten up of lice and worms, and though continually we bear about us a rotten and dead body, we delight to hide it in rich tissue. All our fear, nay, all our terror is, lest our physician should put us in the ground to be made sweet. Your wife's gone to Rome. You two couple and get you to the wells at Lucca to recover your aches. I have other work on foot. 
Exunt, Castruccio, an old lady. I observe our duchess is sick a days. She pukes. Her stomach seethes. The fins of her eyelids look most teeming blue. She wanes in the cheek and waxes fat in the flank. And contrary to our Italian fashion, wears a loose-bodied gown. There's somewhat in it. I have a trick, may chance discover it. A pretty one. I have brought some apricocks. The first our spring yields. Enter Antonio and Delio, talking together apart. And so long since married? You amaze me. Let me seal your lips for ever, for did I think that anything but the air could carry these words from you, I should wish you had no breath at all. Now, sir, in your contemplation, you are studying to become a great wise fellow. Oh, sir, the opinion of wisdom is a foul tetter that runs all over a man's body. If simplicity direct us to have no evil, it directs us to a happy being. For the subtlest folly proceeds from the subtlest wisdom. Let me be simply honest. I do understand your inside. Do you so? Because you would not seem to appear to the world puffed up with your preferment, you continue this out-of-fashion melancholy. Leave it, leave it. Give me leave to be honest in any phrase, in any compliment whatsoever. Shall I confess myself to you? I look no higher than I can reach. They are the gods that must ride on winged horses. A lawyer's mule of a slow pace will both suit my disposition and business. For mark me, when a man's mind rides faster than his horse can gallop, they quickly both tire. You would look up to heaven, but I think the devil that rules in the air stands in your light. Oh, sir, you are lord of the ascendant, chief man with the duchess. A duke was your cousin German removed. Say you were lineally descended from King Pepin or he himself. What of this? Search the heads of the greatest rivers in the world. You shall find them but bubbles of water. Some would think the souls of princes were brought forth by more weighty cause than those of meaner persons. They're deceived. There's the same hand to them. The like passions sway them. The same reason that makes a vicar go to law for a tithe pig and undo his neighbours makes them spoil a whole province and batter down goodly cities with the cannon. Enter Duchess and ladies. Oh, your arm, Antonio. Do I not grow fat? I am exceeding short-winded. Basila, I would have you, sir, provide for me a litter, such a one as the Duchess of Florence rode in. The Duchess used one when she was great with child. I think she did. Come hither, mend my ruff. Here, when thou art such a tedious lady, and thy breath smells of lemon pills, what thou hadst done? Oh, shall I swoon under thy fingers? I am so troubled with the mother. Aside. I fear too much. I have heard you say that the French courtiers wear their hats on for that king. I have seen it. In the presence? Yes. Why should not we bring up that fashion? Tis ceremony more than duty that consists in the removing of a piece of felt. Be you the example to the rest of the court. Put on your hat first. You must pardon me. I have seen, in colder countries than in France, nobles stand bare to the prince and the distinction, methought, showed reverently. I have a present for your grace. For me, sir? Apricocks, madam! Oh, sir, where are they? I have heard of none to year. Aside. Good, her colour rises. Indeed, I thank you. They are wondrous fair ones. What an unskilful fellow is our gardener. We shall have none this month. Will not your grace pair them? No. They taste of musk, methinks. Indeed, they do. Oh, I know not. Yet I wish your grace had paired them. Why? I forgot to tell you. The knave gardener, only to raise his profit by them the sooner, did ripen them in horse-dung. Oh, you jest. You shall judge. Pray, taste one. Indeed, madam, I do not love the fruit. Oh, sir, you are loath to rob us of our dainties. 
"'Tis a delicate fruit. They say they are restorative. "'Tis a pretty art, this grafting. "'Tis so, a bettering of nature. "'To make a pippin grow upon a crab, a damson on a blackthorn. "'Aside. "'How greedily she eats them. "'A whirlwind strike off those bored farthingales, "'for but for that and the loose-bodied gown "'I should have discovered apparently the young springle "'cutting a caper in her belly.' I thank you, Barcela. They were right good ones, if they do not make me sick. How now, madam? Oh, this green fruit and my stomach are not friends. How they swell me. Aside. Nay, you are much too swelled already. Oh, I am in an extreme cold sweat. I'm very sorry. Exit. Oh, lights to my chamber. Oh, good Antonio, I fear I am undone. Lights there, lights. Exeunt, Duchess, and ladies. Oh, my most trusty Dalio, we are lost. I fear she's fallen in labour, and there's left no time for her remove. Have you prepared those ladies to attend her, and procured that politic safe conveyance for the midwife your Duchess plotted? I have. Make use, then, of this forced occasion. Give out that Barcela hath poisoned her with these apricocks. That will give some colour for her keeping close. Fie, fie, the physicians will then flock to her. For that you may pretend she'll use some prepared antidote of her own, lest the physicians should re-poison her. I am lost in amazement. I know not what to think on't. Excellent. Scene two. Enter. Barcela, an old lady. So, so. There's no question but her tetchiness and most vulturous eating of the apricocks are apparent signs of breeding now. I am in haste, sir. There was a young waiting woman, had a monstrous desire to see the glass-house. Nay, pray, let me go. I will hear no more of the glass-house. You are still abusing women. Who, I? No. Only, by the way, now and then mention your frailties. The orange tree bears ripe and green fruit and blossoms all together. And some of you give entertainment for pure love, but more for more precious reward. The lusty spring smells well, but drooping autumn tastes well. If we have the same golden showers that reigned in the time of Jupiter the Thunderer, you have the same Danes still to hold up their legs to receive them. Did Sal never study the mathematics? What's that, sir? Why, to know the trick how to make many lines meet in one centre. Go, go, give your foster daughters good counsel. Tell them that the devil takes delight to hang at a woman's girdle like a false rusty watch, that she cannot discern how the time passes. Exit, old lady. Enter Antonio, Rodrigo, and Grisolan. Shut up the court gates. Why, sir, what's the danger? Shut up the posterns presently, and call all the officers of the court. I shall, instantly. Exit. Who keeps the key of the park gate? For a bosco. Let him bring it presently. Re-enter Grisolan with servants. O oh, gentlemen of the court, the foulest treason! Aside. If that these apricocks should be poisoned now, without my knowledge. There was taken even now a switzer in the duchess' bedchamber. A Switzer? With a pistol. There was a cunning traitor. And all the moulds of his buttons were leaden bullets. Wicked cannibal. Twas a French plot upon my life. To see what the devil can do. Are all the officers here? We are. Gentlemen, we have lost much plate, you know, and but this evening jewels to the value of four thousand ducats are missing in the Duchess' cabinet. Are the gates shut? Yes. "'Tis the Duchess' pleasure each officer be locked into his chamber till the sun rising, and to send the keys of all their chests and of their outward doors into her bedchamber. She is very sick. At her pleasure. She entreats you take not ill. The innocent shall be the more approved by it. Gentlemen of the woodyard, where's your Switzer now? By this hand, twas credibly reported by one of the black guard. Excellent, all except Antonio. And Delio. How fares it with the Duchess? She's exposed unto the worst of torture, pain, and fear. Speak to her all happy comfort. How I do play the fool with mine own danger! 
you are this night dear friend to post to rome my life lies in your service do not doubt me oh tis far from me and yet fear presents me somewhat that looks like danger believe it tis but the shadow of your fear no more how superstitiously we mind our evils the throwing down salt or crossing of a hare bleeding at nose the stumbling of a horse or singing of a cricket are of power to daunt the whole man in us sir fare you well i wish you all the joys of a blessed father and for my faith lay this unto your breast old friends like old swords still are trusted best exit enter cariola sir you are the happy father of a son your wife commends him to you blessed comfort for heaven's sake tend her well i'll presently go set a figure for his nativity excellent scene three enter basola with a dark lantern sure i did hear a woman shriek list ha and the sound came if i received it right from the duchess's lodgings there's some stratagem in the confining all our courtiers to their several wards i must have part of it my intelligence will freeze else list again Maybe may be twas the melancholy bird, best friend of silence and of solitariness, the owl that screamed so. Ah, Antonio! Enter Antonio with a candle, his sword drawn. I heard some noise. Who's there? What art thou? Speak. Antonio, put not your face nor body to such a forced expression of fear. I'm Bossola, your friend. Bossola, aside, this mole does undermine me. Heard you not a noise even now? From whence? From the Duchess lodging. Not I. Did you? I did, or else I dreamed. Let's walk towards it. No. It may be twas but the rising of the wind. Very likely. Methinks tis cold, and yet you sweat. You look wildly. I have been setting a figure for the Duchess jewels. Oh. And how falls your question? Do you find it radical? What's that to you? "'Tis rather to be questioned what design, when all men were commanded to their lodgings, makes you a night-walker. "'In sooth, I'll tell you. Now all the court's asleep, I thought the devil had least to do here. I came to say my prayers. And if it do offend you, I do so. You are a fine courtier. Aside. "'This fellow will undo me. You gave the Duchess apricots to-day. Pray heaven they were not poisoned.' "'Poisoned?' A Spanish fig for the imputation. Traitors are ever confident till they are discovered. There were jewels stolen, too. In my conceit, none are to be suspected more than yourself. You are a false steward. Saucy slave, I'll pull thee up by the roots. Maybe the ruin will crush you to pieces. You are an impudent snake indeed, sir. Are you scarce warm, and do you show your sting? You libel well, sir. No, sir. Copy it out, and I will set my hand to it. Aside. My nose bleeds. One that was superstitious would count this ominous, when it merely comes by chance. Two letters that are wrought here for my name are drowned in blood. Mere accident. For you, sir, I'll take order. In the morn you shall be safe. Aside. Tis that must colour her lying in. Sir, this door you pass not. I do not hold it fit that you come near the Duchess' lodgings till you have quit yourself. Aside. The great are like the base, nay, they are the same, when they seek shameful ways to avoid shame. Exit. Antonio hereabout did drop a paper. Some of your help, false friend. Oh, here it is. What's here? A child's nativity calculated. Reads. The Duchess was delivered of a son between the hours twelve and one in the night, Anno Domini, fifteen o four. That's this year. Decimo nono decembris. That's this night. Taken according to the meridian of Malfi. That's our Duchess. Happy discovery. The Lord of the first house being combust in the ascendant signifies short life, and Mars being in a human sign joined to the tail of the dragon in the eighth house doth threaten a violent death. Cetera non scrutantur. 
Why, tis now most apparent. This precise fellow is the Duchess's bald. I have it to my wish. This is a parcel of intelligency our courtiers were cased up for. It needs must follow that I must be committed on pretence of poisoning her, which I'll endure and laugh at. If one could find the father now, but that time will discover. Old Castruccio in the morning posts to Rome. By him I'll send a letter that shall make her brother's galls o'erflow their livers. This was a thrifty way. Though lust do mask in ne'er so strange disguise, she's oft found witty, but is never wise. Exit. Scene four. Enter. Cardinal and Julia. Sit. Thou art my best of wishes. Prithee, tell me, what trick didst thou invent to come to Rome without thy husband? Why, my lord, I told him I came to visit an old anchorite here for devotion. Thou art a witty false one. I mean, to him. You have prevailed with me beyond my strongest thoughts. I would not now find you inconstant. Do not put thyself to such a voluntary torture, which proceeds out of your own guilt. How, my lord? You fear my constancy, because you've approved those giddy and wild turnings in yourself. Did you e'er find them? Sooth, generally for women, a man might strive to make glass malleable ere he should make them fixed. So, my lord. We had need go borrow that fantastic glass invented by Galileo, the Florentine, to view another spacious world of the moon, look to find a constant woman there. This is very well, my lord. Why do you weep? Are tears your justification? The self-same tears will fall into your husband's bosom, lady, with a loud protestation that you love him above the world. Come, I love you wisely. That's jealously, since I am very certain you cannot make me cuckold. I'll go home to my husband. You may thank me, lady. I have taken you off your melancholy perch, bore you upon my fist, and showed you game, and let you fly at it. I pray thee, kiss me. When thou wast with thy husband, thou wast watched like a tame elephant. Still, you are to thank me. Thou hadst only kisses from him, and high feeding. What delight was that? Twas just like one that hath a little fingering on the lute, yet cannot tune it. Still, you are to thank me. You told me of a piteous wound to the heart and a sick liver when you wooed me first, and spake like one in physic. Who's that? Enter, servant. Rest firm, for my affection to thee, lightning moves slow to it. Madam, a gentleman that's come post from Malfi desires to see you. Let him enter. I'll withdraw. Exit. He says your husband, old Castruccio, is come to Rome, most pitifully tired with riding post. Exit. Enter Delio. Aside. Signor Delio? "'Tis one of my old suitors. "'I was bold to come and see you. "'Sir, you are welcome. "'Do you lie here? "'Sure your own experience will satisfy you, no. "'Our Roman prelates do not keep lodging for ladies.' "'Very well. "'I have brought you no commendations from your husband, "'for I know none by him. "'I hear he's come to Rome. "'I never knew man and beast have a horse and a knight "'so weary of each other.' If he had had a good back, he would have undertaken to have borne his horse. His breech was so pitifully sore. Your laughter is my pity. Lady, I know not whether you want money, but I have brought you some. From my husband? No, from mine own allowance. I must hear the condition ere I be bound to take it. Look, aunt, tis gold. Hath it not a fine colour? I have a bird more beautiful. Try the sound, aunt. A lute-string far exceeds it. It hath no smell like cassia or civet, nor is it physical, though some fond doctors persuade us seethed in culluses. I'll tell you, this is a creature bred by— Re-enter servant. Your husband's come, hath delivered a letter to the Duke of Calabria, that to my thinking hath put him out of his wits. Exit. Sir, you hear? Pray, let me know your business and your suit as briefly as can be. With good speed. I would wish you— at such time as you are non-resident with your husband, my mistress. Sir, I'll go ask my husband if I shall, and straight return your answer. Exit. Very fine. 
Is this her wit or honesty that speaks thus? I heard one say the Duke was highly moved with a letter sent from Malfi. I do fear Antonio is betrayed. How fearfully shows his ambition now! Unfortunate fortune! They pass through whirlpools, and deep woes do shun. Who the event weigh, ere the action's done. Exit. Scene five. Enter Cardinal and Ferdinand with a letter. I have this night digged up a mandrake. Say you? And I am grown mad with it. What's the prodigy? Read there. A sister damned. She's loose the hilts. Grown a notorious strumpet. Speak lower. Lower? Rogues do not whisper it now, but seek to publish it, as servants do the bounty of their lords, aloud and with a covetous searching eye to mark who knows them. Oh, confusion seize her! She hath had most cunning bonds to serve her turn, and more secure conveyances for lust than towns of garrison for service. Is it possible? Can this be certain? Rhubarb! Over oh, rhubarb to purge this collar! Here's the cursed day to prompt my memory, and there shall stick till of her bleeding heart I make a sponge to wipe it out! Why do you make yourself so wild a tempest? Would I could be one, that I might toss her palace about her ears, root up her goodly forests, blast her meads, and lay her general territories waste, as she hath done her honours. Shall our blood, the royal blood of Aragon and Castile, be thus attainted? Apply desperate physic. We must not now use balsam, but fire the smart and cupping glass. For that's the mean to purge infected blood, such blood as hers. There is a kind of pity in my eye. I'll give it to my handkerchief, and now tis here, I'll bequeath this to her bastard. What to do? Why, to make soft lint for his mother's wounds when I have hewed her to pieces. Cursed creature. Unequal nature to place women's hearts so far upon the left side. Foolish men that e'er will trust their honor in a bark made of so slight, weak bulrush as is woman, apt every minute to sink it. Thus ignorance, when it hath purchased honor, it cannot wield it. Methinks I see her laughing. Excellent hyena, talk to me somewhat quickly, or my imagination will carry me to see her in the shameful act of sin. With whom? Happily with some strong-thighed bargeman, or one of the woodyard that can coit the sledge or toss the bar, or else some lovely squire that carries coals up to her privy lodgings. You fly beyond your reason. Go to, mistress! Tis not your whore's milk that shall quench my wildfire, but your whore's blood! How idly shows this rage which carries you, as men conveyed by witches through the air on violent whirlwinds. This intemperate noise fitly resembles deaf men's shrill discourse, who talk aloud, thinking all other men to have their imperfection. Have not you my palsy? Yes, but I can be angry without this rupture. There is not in nature a thing that makes man so deformed, so beastly as doth intemperate anger chide yourself. You have divers men who've never yet expressed their strong desire of rest, but by unrest, by vexing themselves. Come, put yourself in tune. So I will only study to seem the thing I am not. I could kill her now, in you or in myself, for I do think it is some sin in us. Heaven doth revenge by her. Are you stark mad? I would have their bodies burnt in a coal pit with the vintage stopped, that their cursed smoke might not ascend to heaven, or dip the sheets they lie in in pitch or sulphur, wrap them in it, and then light them like a match, or else to boil their bastard to a cullis, and give it his lecherous father to renew the sin of his back. I'll leave you. Nay, I have done. I am confident, had I been damned in hell, and should have heard of this, it would have put me into a cold sweat. In, in, I'll go sleep. Till I know who loves my sister, I'll not stir. That known, 
I'll find scorpions to string my whips and fix her in a general eclipse. Excellent. End of Act Two. Act Three of The Duchess of Malfi. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Duchess of Malfi by John Webster. Act Three, Scene One. Enter Antonio and Delio. Ah, oh, noble friend, my most beloved Delio. Oh, you have been a stranger long at court. Came you along with the Lord Ferdinand? I did, sir. And how fares your noble duchess? Right fortunately well. She's an excellent feeder of pedigrees. Since you last saw her, she hath had two children more, a son and daughter. Methinks t'was yesterday. Let me but wink, and not behold your face, which to mine eye is somewhat leaner. Verily, I should dream it were within this half-hour. You have not been in law, friend Dalio, nor in prison, nor a suitor at the court, nor begged the reversion of some great man's place, nor troubled with an old wife, which doth make your time so insensibly hasten. Pray, sir, tell me, hath not this news arrived yet to the ear of the Lord Cardinal? I fear it hath. The Lord Ferdinand, that's newly come to court, doth bear himself right dangerously. Pray, why? He is so quiet that he seems to sleep the tempest out, as dormice do in winter. Those houses that are haunted are most still till the devil be up. What say the common people? The common rabble do directly say she is a strumpet. And your graver heads, which would be politic, what censure they? They do observe I grow to infinite purchase the left-hand way and all suppose the duchess would amend it if she could for say they great princes though they grudge their officers should have such large and unconfined means to get wealth under them will not complain lest thereby they should make them odious unto the people for other obligation of love or marriage between her and me they never dream of the lord ferdinand is going to bed enter duchess ferdinand and attendants I'll instantly to bed, for I am weary. I am to bespeak a husband for you. For me, sir? Pray, who is't? The great Count Malatesti. Oh, fie upon him! A Count! He's a mere stick of sugar candy. You may look quite through him. When I choose a husband, I will marry for your honour. You shall do well in't. How is't, worthy Antonio? But, sir, I am to have private conference with you about a scandalous report as spread touching mine honour. Let me be ever deaf to it. One of Pasquil's paper bullets, court calumny, a pestilent air which princes' palaces are seldom purged of. Yet say that it were true, I pour it in your bosom, my fixed love would strongly excuse extenuate nay deny faults were they apparent in you go be safe in your own innocency aside o oh, blessed comfort this deadly air is purged excellent duchess antonio delio and attendants for guilt treads on hot burning coals. enter bossola now bossola how thrives our intelligence sir uncertain tis rumoured she hath had three bastards but by whom we may go read in the stars why some hold opinion all things are written there yes if we could find spectacles to read them i do suspect there has been some sorcery used on the duchess sorcery to what purpose to make her dote on some desertless fellow she shames to acknowledge can your faith give way to think there is power in potions or in charms to make us love whether we will or no most certainly away these are mere gulleries horrid things invented by some cheating mountebanks to abuse us do you think that herbs or charms can force the will some trials have been made in this foolish practice but the ingredients were lenative poisons 
such as are of force to make the patient mad and straight the witch swears by equivocation they are in love the witchcraft lies in her rank blood this night i will force confession from her you told me you had got within these two days a false key into her bedchamber i have as i would wish what do you intend to do can you guess no do not ask then he that can compass me and know my drifts may say he hath put a girdle about the world and sounded all her quicksands i do not think so what do you think then pray that you are your own chronicle too much and grossly flatter yourself give me thy hand i thank thee i never gave pension but to flatterers till i entertained thee farewell that friend a great man's ruin strongly checks who rails into his belief all his defects Excellent. Scene two. Enter Duchess, Antonio, and Cariola. Bring me the casket hither and the glass. You get no lodging here tonight, my lord. Indeed, I must persuade one. <laughs> Very good. I hope in time twill grow into a custom that noblemen shall come with cap and knee to purchase a night's lodging of their wives. I must lie here. Must? You are a lord of misrule. Indeed, my rule is only in the night. <laughs> I'll stop your mouth. Kisses him. Nay, that's but one. Venus had two soft doves to draw her chariot. I must have another. <clears throat> she kisses him again. When wilt thou marry, Cariola? Never, my lord. Oh, fie upon this single life, forego it. We read how Daphne, for her peevish flight, became a fruitless bay-tree. Syrinx turned to the pale, empty reed. Anaxarete was frozen into marble. Whereas those which married, or proved kind unto their friends, were by a gracious influence transshaped into the olive, pomegranate, mulberry, became flowers, precious stones, or eminent stars. This is a vain poetry. But I pray you tell me, if there were proposed me wisdom, riches, and beauty in three several young men, which should I choose? Tis a hard question. This was Paris' case, and he was blinded. And there was a great cause, for how was it possible he could judge right, having three amorous goddesses in view, and they stark naked? "'Twas a motion were able to benight the apprehension of the severest counsellor of Europe. Now I look on both your faces so well formed, it puts me in mind of a question I would ask. What is't? I do wonder why hard-favoured ladies, for the most part, keep worse-favoured waiting women to attend them, and cannot endure fair ones. Oh, that is soon answered. Did you ever in your life know an ill painter desire to have his dwelling next door to the shop of an excellent picture-maker? T'would disgrace his face-making, and undo him. I prithee, when were we so merry? My hair tangles. Pray thee, Cariola, let's steal forth the room, and let her talk to herself. I have divers times served her the like, when she hath chafed extremely. I love to see her angry. Softly, Cariola. Exxon. Antonio and Cariola. Doth not the colour of my hair gin to change? When I wax grey, I shall have all the court powder their hair with arras, to be like me. You have cause to love me. I entered you into my heart. Enter Ferdinand, unseen. Before you would vouchsafe to call for the keys. We shall one day have my brothers take you napping. Methinks his presence, being now in court, should make you keep your own bed. But you'll say love mixed with fear is sweetest. I'll assure you, you shall get no more children till my brothers consent to be your gossips. Have you lost your tongue? Tis welcome. For know, whether I am doomed to live or die, I can do both like a prince. Die, then, quickly! Giving her a poniard. Virtue, 
where art thou hid? What hideous thing is it that doth eclipse thee? Oh, pray, sir, hear me. Or is it true thou art but a bare name and no essential thing? Sir! Do not speak! No, sir. I will plant my soul in mine ears to hear you. O oh, most imperfect light of human reason, that makes us so unhappy to foresee what we can least prevent. Pursue thy wishes and glory in them. There is in shame no comfort but to be past all bounds and sense of shame. I pray, sir, hear me. I am married. So? Happily. Not to your liking. But for that, alas, your shears do come untimely now to clip the bird's wings that's already flown. Will you see my husband? Yes, if I could change eyes with a basilisk. Sure you came hither by his confederacy. The howling of a wolf is music to thee, screech owl. Prithee, peace! Whate'er thou art that hast enjoyed my sister, for I am sure thou hearest me. For thine own sake let me not know thee. I came hither prepared to work thy discovery, yet am now persuaded it would beget such violent effects as would damn us both. I would not for ten millions I had beheld thee, therefore use all means I never may have knowledge of thy name. Enjoy thy lust still, and a wretched life on that condition. And for thee, vile woman, if thou do wish thy lecher may grow old in thy embracements, I would have thee build such a room for him as our anchorites to holier use inhabit. Let not the sun shine on him till he's dead. Let dogs and monkeys only converse with him, and such dumb things to whom nature denies use to sound his name. Do not keep a parakeet, lest she learn it. If thou do love him, cut out thine own tongue, lest it bewray him. Why might I not marry? I have not gone about in this to create any new world or custom. Thou art undone, and thou hast taken that massy sheet of lead that hid thy husband's bones, and folded it about my heart. Mine bleeds for it. Thine? Thy heart? What should I name it, unless a hollow bullet filled with unquenchable wildfire? You are in this too strict. And were you not my princely brother, I would say, too willful? My reputation is safe. Dost thou know what reputation is? I'll tell thee to some small purpose, since the instruction comes now too late. Upon a time, reputation, love, and death would travel o'er the world, and it was concluded that they should part and take three several ways. Death told them they should find him in great battles or cities plagued with plagues. Love gives them counsel to inquire for him amongst unambitious shepherds, where dowries were not talked of, and sometimes amongst quiet kindred that had nothing left by their dead parents. Stay, quoth reputation, do not forsake me, for it is my nature if once I part from any man I meet, I am never found again. And so for you, you have shook hands with reputation and made him invisible. So fare you well, I will never see you more. Why should only I, of all the other princes of the world, be cased up like a holy relic? I have youth and a little beauty. So you have some virgins that are witches. I'll never see any more. Exit. Re-enter Antonio with a pistol. And Cariola. You saw this apparition. Yes, we are betrayed. How came he hither? I should turn this to thee for that. Pray, sir, do. And when that you have cleft my heart, you shall read there mine innocence. That gallery gave him entrance. I would this terrible thing would come again, that, standing on my guard, I might relate my warrantable love. She shows the poniard. Ah, what means this? He left this with me. And it seems did wish you would use it on yourself. His action seemed to intend so much. This hath a handle to it as well as a point. Turn it towards him, and so fasten the keen edge in his rank gall. Knocking within. 
How now? Who knocks? More earthquakes. I stand as if a mine beneath my feet were ready to be blown up. Tis Basila. Away! Oh, misery! Methinks unjust actions should wear these masks and curtains, and not we! You must instantly part hence. I have fashioned it already. Exit. Antonio. Enter. Basila. The Duke, your brother, is ta'en up in a whirlwind, hath took horse, and rid post to Rome. So late? He told me, as he mounted into the saddle, you were undone. Indeed, I am very near it. What's the matter? Antonio, the master of our household, hath dealt so falsely with me in accounts. My brother stood engaged with me for money, ta'en up of certain Neapolitan Jews, and Antonio lets the bonds be forfeit. Strange. Aside. This is cunning. And hereupon my brother's bills at Naples are protested against. Call up our officers. I shall. Exit. Re-enter Antonio. The place that you must fly to is Ancona. Hire a house there. I'll send after you my treasure and my jewels. Our weak safety runs upon enginous wheels. Short syllables must stand for periods. I must now accuse you of such a feigned crime as Tasso calls magnanima menzogna, a noble lie, cause it must shield our honours. Hark, they are coming. Re-enter Basola and officers. Will your grace hear me? I have got well by you. You have yielded me a million of loss. I am like to inherit the people's curses for your stewardship. You had the trick in audit time to be sick, till I had signed your quietus, and that cured you without help of a doctor. Gentlemen, I would have this man be an example to you all. So shall you hold my favour. I pray, let him, for has done that, alas, you would not think of, and because I intend to be rid of him, I mean not to publish. Use your fortune elsewhere. I am strongly armed to brook my overthrow, as commonly men bear with a hard year. I will not blame the cause on't, but do think the necessity of my malevolent star procures this, not her humour. Oh, the inconstant and rotten ground of service! You may see it is even like him that in a winter night takes a long slumber or a dying fire, a loath to part from't yet parts thence as cold as when he first sat down. We do confiscate, towards the satisfying of your accounts, all that you have. I am all yours, and tis very fit all mine should be so. So, sir, you have your pass. You may see, gentlemen, what tis to serve a prince with body and soul. Exit. Here's an example for extortion. What moisture is drawn out of the sea, when foul weather comes, pours down and runs into the sea again. I would know what are your opinions of this Antonio. He could not abide to see a pig's head gaping. I thought your grace would find him a Jew. A would you had been his officer, for your own sake. You would have had more money. He stopped his ears with black wool, and to those came to him for money said he was thick of hearing. Some said he was an hermaphrodite, for he could not abide a woman. How scurvy proud he would look when the treasury was full. <laughs> well, let him go. Yes, and the chippings of the buttery fly after him to scour his gold chain. Leave us. Excellent, officers. What do you think of these? That these are rogues, that in his prosperity, but to have waited on his fortune could have wished his dirty stirrup riveted through their noses and followed after his mule like a bear in a ring, would have prostituted their daughters to his lust, made their first-born intelligences, thought none happy but such as were born under his blessed planet and wore his livery. And do these lice drop off now? Well, never look to have the like again. He hath left a sort of flattering rogues behind him, their doom must follow. Princes pay flatterers in their own money. Flatterers dissemble their vices, and they dissemble their lies. That's justice. Alas, poor gentleman. Poor? He hath amply filled his coffers. Sure, he was too honest. Pluto, the god of riches, when he's sent by Jupiter to any man, he goes limping to signify that wealth that comes on God's name comes slowly. But when he's sent on the devil's errand, 
he rides post and comes in by scuttles. Let me show you what a most unvalued jewel you have in a wanton humour thrown away to bless the man shall find him. He was an excellent courtier and most faithful. A soldier that thought it as beastly to know his own value too little as devilish to acknowledge it too much. Both his virtue and form deserved a far better fortune. His discourse rather delighted to judge itself than show itself. His breast was filled with all perfection, and yet it seemed a private whispering room that made so little noise of it. But he was basely descended. Will you make yourself a mercenary herald, rather to examine men's pedigrees than virtues? You shall want him, for no, an honest statesman to a prince is like a cedar planted by a spring. The spring bathes the tree's root, the grateful tree rewards it with his shadow. You have not done so. I would rather swim to the Bermudas on two politicians' rotten bladders tied together with an intelligence's heart-string than depend on so changeable a prince's favour. Fare thee well, Antonio, since the malice of the world would needs down with thee, it cannot be said yet that any ill happened unto thee, considering thy fall was accompanied with virtue. Oh, you render me excellent music. Say you? This good one that you speak of is my husband. Do I not dream? Can this ambitious age have so much goodness in it as to prefer a man merely for worth, without these shadows of wealth and painted honours? Possible? I have had three children by him. Fortunate lady, for you have made your private nuptial bed the humble and fair seminary of peace, no question but. Many an unbeneficed scholar shall pray for you for this deed, and rejoice that some preferment in the world can yet arise from merit. The virgins of your land that have no dowries shall hope your example will raise them to rich husbands. Should you want soldiers to make the very Turks and Moors turn Christians and serve you for this act? Last the neglected poets of your time, in honour of this trophy of a man, raised by that curious engine your white hand, shall thank you in your grave for it, and make that more reverend than all the cabinets of living princes. For Antonio, his fame shall likewise flow from many a pen, when heralds shall want coats to sell to men. As I taste comfort in this friendly speech, so would I find concealment. Oh, the secret of my prince, which I will wear on the inside of my heart. You shall take charge of all my coin and jewels, and follow him, for he retires himself to Ancona. So? Whither within few days I mean to follow thee. Let me think. I would wish your grace to feign a pilgrimage to Our Lady of Loretto, scarce seven leagues from fair Ancona. So may you depart your country with more honour, and your flight will seem a princely progress, retaining your usual train about you. Sir, your direction shall lead me by the hand. In my opinion, she were better progress to the baths at Lucca, or go visit the spa in Germany. For if you will believe me, I do not like this jesting with religion, this feigned pilgrimage. Thou art a superstitious fool. Prepare us instantly for our departure. Past sorrows, let us moderately lament them. For those to come, seek wisely to prevent them. Excellent, Duchess and Cariola. A politician is the devil's quilted anvil. He fashions all sins on him and the blows are never heard. He may work in a lady's chamber, as here for proof. What rests but I reveal all to my lord? Oh, this base quality of intelligence, sir! Why, every quality in the world prefers but gain or commendation. Now, for this act, I am certain to be raised, and men that paint weeds to the life are praised. Exit. Scene three. Enter Cardinal, Ferdinand, Malateste, Pescara, Delio, and Silvio. Must we turn soldier then? 
The Emperor, hearing your worth that way, ere you attain this reverend garment, joins you in commission with the right fortunate soldier, the Marquise of Pescara, and the famous Lannoy. He that had the honour of taking the French king prisoner? The same. Here's a plot drawn for a new fortification at Naples. This great Count Malatesti, I perceive, hath got employment. No employment, my lord. A marginal note in the muster-book, that he is a voluntary lord. He's no soldier. He has worn gunpowder in his hollow tooth for the toothache. He comes to the leaguer with a full intent to eat fresh beef and garlic, means to stay till the scent be gone, and straight return to court. He hath read all the late service, as the city chronicle relates it, and keeps two pewterers going, only to express battles in model. Then he'll fight by the book. By the almanac, I think, to choose good days, and shun the critical. That's his mistress's scarf. Yes, he protests he would do much for that taffeta. I think he would run away from a battle to save it from taking prisoner. He is horribly afraid gunpowder will spoil the perfume on it. I saw a Dutchman break his pate once for calling him a pot-gun. He made his head have a bore in like a musket. I would he had made a touch-hole to it. He is indeed a guarded sumter cloth, only for the removal of the court. Enter Basila. Basila arrived. What should be the business? Some falling out amongst the cardinals. These factions amongst great men, they are like foxes. When their heads are divided, they carry fire in their tails, and all the country about them goes to rack for it. What's that, Basola? I knew him in Padua, a fantastical scholar, like such as study to know how many knots was in Hercules's club, of what colour Achilles' beard was, or whether Hector were not troubled with the toothache. He hath studied himself half blear-eyed to know the true symmetry of Caesar's nose by a shoeing horn, and this he did to gain the name of a speculative man. Mark Prince Ferdinand. A very salamander lives in eye to mark the eager violence of fire. That cardinal hath made more bad faces with his oppression than ever Michael Angelo made good ones. He lifts up snows like a foul porpoise before a storm. The Lord Ferdinand laughs. Like a deadly cannon that lightens ere it smokes. These are your true pangs of death, the pangs of life that struggle with great statesmen. In such a deformed silence, witches whisper their charms. Doth she make religion her riding hood to keep her from the sun and tempest? That, that damns her. Methinks her fault and beauty blended together show like leprosy the whiter, the fouler. I make the question whether her beggarly brats were ever christened. I will instantly solicit the state of Ancona to have them banished. You are for Loretto. I shall not be at your ceremony. Fare you well. Write to the Duke of Malfi, my young nephew she had by her first husband, and acquaint him with mother's honesty. I will. Antonio, a slave that only smelled of ink and counters, and never in his life looked like a gentleman but in the audit time. Go, go presently. Draw me out a hundred and fifty of our horse, and meet me at the fort bridge. Excellent. Scene four. Enter two pilgrims to the shrine of Our Lady of Loretto. I have not seen a goodlier shrine than this, yet I have visited many. The Cardinal of Aragon is this day to resign his cardinal's hat. His sister Duchess, likewise, is arrived to pay her vow of pilgrimage. I expect a noble ceremony. No question. They come. Here the ceremony of the cardinal's installment, in the habit of a soldier, performed in delivering up his cross, hat, robes, and ring, at the shrine, and investing him with sword, helmet, shield, and spurs. Then Antonio, the duchess, and their children, having presented themselves at the shrine, are, by a form of banishment and dumb show, expressed towards them by the cardinal, in the state of Ancona, banished, during all which ceremony this ditty is sung, to very solemn music, by diverse churchmen, and then exeunt all except the two pilgrims. Arms and honors deck thy story, to thy fame's eternal glory. Adverse fortune ever fly thee, no disastrous fate come nigh thee. I alone will sing thy praises, 
whom to honor virtue raises, and thy study that divine is, bent to martial discipline is. Lay aside all those robes lie by thee, crown thy arts with arms, they'll beautify thee. O worthy of worthiest name, adorned in this manner, lead bravely thy forces on, under war's warlike banner. O mayest thou prove fortunate in all martial courses, guide thou still by skill in arts and forces. Victory attend thee nigh, whilst fame sings loud thy powers. Triumphant conquest crown thy head, and blessings pour down showers. Here's a strange turn of state. Who would have thought so great a lady would have matched herself unto so mean a person? Yet the cardinal bears himself much too cruel. They are banished. But I would ask what power have this state of Ancona to determine of a free prince? They are a free state, sir, and her brother showed how that the Pope, forehearing of her looseness, hath seized into the protection of the church the dukedom which she held as dowager. But by what justice? Sure, I think, by none, only her brother's instigation. What was it with such violence he took off from her finger? Twas her wedding ring, which he vowed shortly he would sacrifice to his revenge. Alas, Antonio, if that a man be thrust into a well, no matter who sets hand to it, his own weight will bring him sooner to the bottom. Come, let's hence. Fortune makes this conclusion general. All things do help the unhappy man to fall. Excellent. Scene 5. Enter. Duchess, Antonio, children. Cariola and servants. Banished Ancona. Ah, yes, you see what power lightens in great men's breath. Is all our train shrunk to this poor remainder? These poor men which have got little in your service vow to take your fortune. But your wiser buntings, now they are fledged, are gone. They have done wisely. This puts me in mind of death. Physicians thus, with their hands full of money, used to give o'er their patients. Right the fashion of the world, from decayed fortunes every flatterer shrinks. Men cease to build where the foundation sinks. I had a very strange dream to-night. What was't? Methought I wore my coronet of state, and on a sudden all the diamonds were changed to pearls. My interpretation is you'll weep shortly. For to me the pearls do signify your tears. The birds that live i' the field on the wild benefit of nature live happier than we, for they may choose their mates, and carol their sweet pleasures to the spring. Enter Basola with a letter. <sighs> you are happily Hortean. From my brother? Yes. From the Lord Ferdinand, your brother, all love and safety. Thou dost blanch mischief, wouldst make it white. See, see, like to calm weather at sea before a tempest, false hearts speak fair to those they intend most mischief. Reads. Send Antonio to me. I want his head in a business. A politic equivocation. He doth not want your counsel, but your head. That is, he cannot sleep till you be dead. And here's another pitfall that's strewed o'er with roses. Mark it, tis a cunning one. Reads. I stand engaged for your husband for several debts at Naples. Let not that trouble him. I had rather have his heart than his money. And I will leave so, too. What do you believe? That he so much distrusts my husband's love, he will by no means believe his heart is with him until he see it. The devil is not cunning enough to circumvent us in riddles. Will you reject that noble and free league of amity and love which I present you? Their league is like that of some politic kings, only to make themselves of strength and power to be our after-woman. Tell them so. And um, what from you? Thus tell him, I will not come. And what of this? My brothers have dispersed bloodhounds abroad, which till I hear are muzzled, no truce, though hatched with ne'er such politic skill, is safe that hangs upon our enemy's will. I'll not come at them. This proclaims your breeding, for every small thing draws a base mind to fear, as the adamant draws iron. Fare you well, sir. You shall shortly hear from us. Exit. I suspect some ambush. 
Therefore by all my love I do conjure you to take your eldest son and fly towards Milan. Let us not venture all this poor remainder in one unlucky bottom. You counsel safely. Best of my life, farewell. Since we must part, heaven hath a hand in't, but no otherwise than as some curious artist takes in sunder a clock or watch when it is out of frame, to bring't in better order. I know not which is best, to see you dead or part with you. Farewell, boy. Thou art happy that thou hast not understanding to know thy misery, for all our wit and reading brings us to a truer sense of sorrow. In the eternal church, sir, I do hope we shall not part thus. O oh, be of comfort, make patience a noble fortitude, and think not how unkindly we are used. Man, like to Cassia, is proved best being bruised. Must I, like to slave-born Russian, account it praise to suffer tyranny? And yet, O oh, heaven, thy heavy hand is in it. I have seen my little boy oft scourge his top, and compared myself to it. Not made me e'er go right, but heaven's scourge-stick. Do not weep. Heaven fashioned us of nothing, and we strive to bring ourselves to nothing. Farewell, Coriola, and thy sweet armful. If I do never see thee more, be a good mother to your little ones, and save them from the tiger. Fare you well. Let me look upon you once more, for that speech came from a dying father. Your kiss is colder than that I have seen an holy anchorite give to a dead man's skull. My heart is turned to a heavy lump of lead with which I sound my danger. Fare you well. Exeunt Antonio and his son. My laurel is all withered. Look, madam. What a troop of armed men make toward us! Re-enter Bosla, disarded, with a guard. Oh, they are very welcome. When fortune's wheel is overcharged with princes, the weight makes it move swift. I would have my ruin be sudden. I am your adventure, am I not? You are. You must see your husband no more. What devil art thou that counterfeitst heaven's thunder? Is that terrible? I would have you tell me whether. Is that note worse that frights the silly birds out of the corn, or that which does allure them to the nets? You have hearkened to the last too much. O oh, misery! Like to a rusty or charged cannon, shall I never fly in pieces? Come, to what prison? To none. Whither, then? To your palace. I have heard that Charon's boat serves to convey all o'er the dismal lake, but brings none back again. Your brothers mean you safety and pity. Pity? With such a pity men preserve alive pheasants and quails when they are not fat enough to be eaten. These are your children? Yes. Can they prattle? No. But I intend, since they were born accursed, curses shall be their first language. Fie, madam! Forget this base low fellow. Were I a man, I'd beat that counterfeit face into thy other. One of no birth. Say that he was born mean. Man is most happy whence own actions be arguments and examples of his virtue. A barren, beggarly virtue. I prithee, who is greatest? Can you tell? Sad tales befit my woe, I'll tell you one. A salmon, as she swam unto the sea, met with a dogfish, who encounters her with this rough language. Why art thou so bold to mix thyself with our high state of floods, being no eminent courtier, but one that for the calmest and fresh time of the year dost live in shallow rivers, rankst thyself with silly smelts and shrimps? And darest thou pass by our dog-ship without reverence? Oh, quoth the salmon, sister, be at peace. Thank Jupiter we both have passed the net. Our value never can be truly known, till in the fisher's basket we be shown. I the market, then, my price may be the higher, even when I am nearest to the cook and fire. 
so to great men the moral may be stretched. Men oft are valued high when they're most wretched. But come, whither you please, I am armed against misery, bent to all sways of the oppressor's will. There's no deep valley but near some great hill. Excellent. End of Act Three. Act Four of the Duchess of Malfi. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Duchess of Malfi by John Webster. Act Four, Scene One. Enter Ferdinand and Basola. How doth our sister Duchess bear herself in her imprisonment? Nobly, I'll describe her. She's sad as one long used to it, and she seems rather to welcome the end of misery than shun it. A behaviour so noble as gives a majesty to adversity. You may discern the shape of loveliness more perfect in her tears than in her smiles. She will muse for hours together, and her silence, methinks, expresseth more than if she spake. Her melancholy seems to be fortified with a strange disdain. Tis so, and this restraint, like English mastiffs that grow fierce with tying, makes her too passionately apprehend those pleasures she is kept from. Curse upon her! I will no longer study in the book of another's heart. Inform her what I told you. Exit. Enter Duchess and attendants. All comfort to your grace. I will have none. Pray thee, why dost thou wrap thy poisoned pills in gold and sugar? Your elder brother, the Lord Ferdinand, is come to visit you, and sends you word, cause he once rashly made a solemn vow never to see you more, he comes in night, and prays you, Gently, neither torch nor taper shine in your chamber. He will kiss your hand and reconcile himself, but for his vow he dares not see you. At his pleasure. Take hence the lights. He's come. Exunt attendants with lights. Enter Ferdinand. Where are you? Here, sir. This darkness suits you well? I would ask you pardon. You have it, for I account it the honorablest revenge, where I may kill to pardon. Where are your cubs? Whom? Oh, call them your children, for though our national law distinguish bastards from true, legitimate issue, compassionate nature makes them all equal. Do you visit me for this? You violate a sacrament of the church, shall make you howl in hell for it. It had been well, could you have lived thus always, for indeed, you were too much in the light. But no more. I come to seal my peace with you. Here's a hand. Gives her a dead man's hand. To which you have vowed much love. The ring upon you gave. I affectionately kiss it. Pray do and bury the point of it in your heart. I will leave this ring with you for a love token, and the hand as sure as the ring, and do not doubt but you shall have the heart, too. When you need a friend, send to him that owed it. You shall see whether he can aid you. You are very cold. I fear you are not well after your travel. Ah, oh, lights! Oh, horrible! Let her have lights enough. Excellent. What witchcraft doth he practice that he hath left a dead man's hand here? Here is discovered behind a traverse the artificial figures of Antonio and his children, appearing as if they were dead. Look you, here's the piece from which t'was ta'en. He doth present you this sad spectacle, that now you know directly they are dead, hereafter you may wisely cease to grieve 
for that which cannot be recovered. <sighs> there is not between heaven and earth one wish I stay for after this. It wastes me more than twere my picture fashioned out of wax, stuck with a magical needle, and then buried in some foul dunghill. And yon's an excellent property for a tyrant, which I would account mercy. What's that? If they would bind me to that lifeless trunk, and let me freeze to death. Come, you must live. That's the greatest torture souls feel in hell. In hell that they must live and cannot die. Portia, I'll new kindle thy coals again, and revive the rare and almost dead example of a loving wife. Oh, fie! Despair! Remember, you are a Christian. The church enjoins fasting. I'll starve myself to death. Leave this vain sorrow. Things being at the worst begin to mend. The bee, when he hath shot his sting into your hand, may then play with your eyelid. Good, comfortable fellow. Persuade a wretch that's broke upon the wheel to have all his bones new set. Entreat him live to be executed again. Who must dispatch me? I account this world a tedious theatre, for I do play a part in't against my will. Come, be of comfort. I will save your life. Indeed, I have not leisure to tend so small a business. Now, by my life, I pity you. Thou art a fool, then, to waste thy pity on a thing so wretched as cannot pity itself. I am full of daggers. Puff, let me blow these vipers from me. Enter servant. What are you? One that wishes you long life. I would thou wert hanged for the horrible curse thou hast given me. I shall shortly grow one of the miracles of pity. I'll go pray. Exit, servant. No, I'll go curse. Oh, fie! I could curse the stars. Oh, fearful! And those three smiling seasons of the year into a Russian winter, nay, the world to its first chaos. Look you, the stars shine still. Oh, but you must remember my curse hath a great way to go. Plagues that make lanes through largest families consume them. Fie, lady! Let them, like tyrants, never be remembered but for the ill they have done. Let all the zealous prayers of mortified churchmen forget them. Oh, uncharitable! Let heaven a little while cease crowning martyrs to punish them. Go, howl them this, and say I long to bleed. It is some mercy when men kill with speed. Exit. Re-enter Ferdinand. Excellent! As I would wish, she's plagued in art. These presentations are but framed in wax. By the curious master in that quality, Vincenzo Loriola, and she takes them for true, substantial bodies. Why do you do this? To bring her to despair. Faith, end here, and go no farther in your cruelty. Send her a penitential garment to put on next to her delicate skin, and furnish her with beads and prayer books. Damn her! That body of hers! While that my blood ran pure in, was more worth than that which thou wouldst comfort, call the soul. I will send her masks of common courtesans, have her meat served up by bods and ruffians, and cause she'll needs be mad, I am resolved to remove forth the common hospital, all the mad folk, and place them near her lodging. Then let them practice together, sing and dance, and set their gambols to the full of the moon. If she can sleep the better for it, let her. Your work is almost ended. Must I see her again? Yes. Never. You must. Never in mine own shape. That's forfeited by my intelligence and this last cruel lie. When you send me next, the business shall be comfort. Very likely. Thy pity is nothing of kin to thee. Antonio looks about Milan. Thou shalt shortly thither to feed a fire as great as my revenge, which never will slack till it have spent his fuel. Intemperate agues make physicians cruel. Excellent. Scene two. Enter. Duchess and Cariola. What hideous noise was that? 
tis the wild consort of madmen lady which your tyrant brother hath placed about your lodging this tyranny i think was never practised till this hour indeed i thank him nothing but noise and folly can keep me in my right wits whereas reason and silence make me stark mad sit down discourse to me some dismal tragedy oh twill increase your melancholy thou art deceived to hear of greater grief would lessen mine this is a prison yes but you shall live to shake this durance off thou art a fool the robin red breast and the nightingale never live long in cages pray dry your eyes what think you of madam of nothing when i muse thus i sleep like a madman with your eyes open dost thou think we shall know one another in the other world yes out of question oh that it were possible we might but hold some two days conference with the dead from them i should learn somewhat i am sure i never shall know here i'll tell thee a miracle i am not mad yet to my cause of sorrow the heaven o'er my head seems made of molten brass the earth of flaming sulphur yet i am not mad i am acquainted with sad misery as the tanned galley slave is with his oar necessity makes me suffer constantly and custom makes it easy who do i look like now like to your picture in the gallery a deal of life in show but none in practice or rather like some reverend monument whose ruins are even pitied very proper and fortune seems only to have her eyesight to behold my tragedy how now what noise is that enter servant i am come to tell you your brother hath intended you some sport a great physician when the pope was sick of a deep melancholy presented him with several sorts of madmen which wild object being full of change and sport forced him to laugh and so the imposthume broke the self-same cure the duke intends on you let them come in there's a mad lawyer and a secular priest a doctor that hath forfeited his wits by jealousy an astrologian that in his work said such a day of the month should be the day of doom and failing of to ran mad an english tailor crazed i the brain with the study of new fashions a gentleman usher quite beside himself with care to keep in mind the number of his lady's salutations or how do you she employed him each morning a farmer too an excellent knave in grain mad cause he was hindered transportation and let one broker that's mad loose to these you'd think the devil were among them sit cariola let them loose when you please for i am chained to endure all your tyranny enter madman here by a madman the song is sung to a dismal kind of music oh let us howl some heavy note some deadly dogged howl sounding as from the threatening throat of beasts and fatal fowl as ravens screech owls bulls and bears will bell and bawl our parts till irksome noise have cloyed your ears and corrosive ed your hearts at last when as our choir wants breath our bodies being blessed will sing like swans to welcome death and die in love and rest doomsday not come yet i'll draw it nearer by a perspective or make a glass that shall set all the world on fire upon an instant i cannot sleep my pillow is stuffed with a litter of porcupines hell is a mere glass house where the devils are continually blowing up women's souls on hollow irons and the fire never goes out i have skill in heraldry hast you give for your crest a woodcock's head with the brains picked out on it you are a very ancient gentleman greek is turned turk we are only to be saved by the helvetian translation come on sir i will lay the law to you 
Oh, rather lay a corrosive. The law will eat to the bone. He that drinks but to satisfy nature is damned. If I had my glass here, I would show a sight should make all the women here call me mad doctor. What's he? A rope maker? No, no, no. A snuffling knave, that while he shows the tombs, will have his hand in a wench's placket. Woe to the carosh that brought home my wife from the mask at three o'clock in the morning. It had a large feather bed in it. I have pared the devil's nails forty times, roasted them in raven's eggs, and cured agues with them. Get me three hundred milch bats to make possets to procure sleep. All the college may throw their caps at me. I have made a soap boiler costive. It was my masterpiece. Here the dance, consisting of eight madmen, with music answerable thereunto, after which Basola, like an old man, enters. Is he mad too? Pray question him. I'll leave you. Excellent servant and madman. I am come to make thy tomb. Ha! <laughs> my tomb? Thou speak'st as if I lay upon my deathbed, gasping for breath. Dost thou perceive me sick? Yes, and the more dangerously, since thy sickness is insensible. Thou art not mad, sure. Dost know me? Yes. Who am I? Thou art a box of worm seed, at best but a salvatory of green mummy. What's this flesh? A little curded milk, fantastical puff paste. Our bodies are weaker than those paper prisons boys use to keep flies in. More contemptible, since ours is to preserve earthworms. Didst thou ever see a lark in a cage? Such is the soul in the body. This world is like her little turf of grass, and the heaven o'er our heads, like her looking-glass, only gives us a miserable knowledge of the small compass of our prison. Am not I thy duchess? Thou art some great woman, sure. For riot begins to sit on thy forehead, clad in grey hairs, twenty years sooner than on a merry milkmaid's. Thou sleepest worse than if a mouse should be forced to take up her lodging in a cat's ear. A little infant that breeds its teeth, should it lie with thee, will cry out as if thou wert the more unquiet bedfellow. I am Duchess of Malfi still. That makes thy sleep so broken. Glories like glow-worms afar off shine bright, but looked too near have neither heat nor light. Thou art very plain. My trade is to flatter the dead not the living. I am a tomb-maker. And thou comest to make my tomb? Yes. <laughs> Let me be a little merry. Of what stuff wilt thou make it? Nay, resolve me first. Of what fashion? Why, do we grow fantastical on our deathbed? Do we affect fashion in the grave? Most ambitiously. Princes' images on their tombs do not lie as they were wont, seeming to pray up to heaven, but with their hands under their cheeks, as if they died of the toothache. They are not carved with their eyes fixed upon the stars, but, as their minds were wholly bent upon the world, the selfsame way they seem to turn their faces. Let me know fully, therefore, the effect of this thy dismal preparation, this talk fit for a charnel. Now I shall. Enter executioners, with a coffin, cords, and a bell. Here is a present from your princely brothers, and may it arrive welcome, for it brings last benefit, last sorrow. Let me see it. I have so much obedience in my blood, I wish it in their veins to do them good. This is your last presence chamber. Oh, my sweet lady! Peace. It affrights not me. I am the common bellman that usually is sent to condemned persons the night before they suffer. Even now thou saidst thou wast a tomb-maker. 
which was to bring you by degrees to mortification. Listen. Hark, now everything is still. The screech owl and the whistler shrill call upon our dame aloud and bid her quickly don her shroud. Much you had of land and rent, your length in clays now competent. A long war disturbed your mind, here your perfect peace is signed. Of what is fools make such vain keeping? Sin, their conception, their birth, weeping, their life a general mist of error, their death a hideous storm of terror. Strew your hair with powders sweet, don clean linen, bathe your feet, and the foul fiend more to check, a crucifix let bless your neck. Tis now full tide tween night and day, end your groan. And come away. Hence, villains, tyrants, murderers, alas, what will you do with my lady? Call for help. To whom? To our next neighbours. They are mad folks. Remove that noise. Farewell, Cariola. In my last will I have not much to give. How many hungry guests have fed upon me. Thine will be a poor reversion. I will die with her. I pray thee. Look, thou givest my little boy some syrup for his cold. And let the girl say her prayers ere she sleep. Cariola is forced out by the executioners. Now, what you please. What death? Strangling. Here are your executioners. I forgive them. The apoplexy, catarrh, or cough of the lungs would do as much as they do. Doth not death fright you? Who would be afraid on't, knowing to meet such excellent company in the other world? Yet, methinks, the manner of your death should much afflict you. This cold should terrify you. Not a whit. What would it pleasure me to have my throat cut with diamonds, or to be smothered with cassia, or to be shot to death with pearls? I know death hath ten thousand several doors for men to take their exits, and tis found they go on such strange geometrical hinges you may open them both ways. Anyway, for heaven's sake, so I were out of your whispering. Tell my brothers that I perceive death now I am well awake. Best gift is they can give or I can take. I would fain put off my last woman's fault. I'd not be tedious to you. We are ready. Dispose my breath how please you, but my body bestow upon my women, will you? Yes. Pull, and pull strongly, for your able strength must pull down heaven upon me. Yet stay. Heaven's gates are not so highly arched as princes' palaces. They that enter there must go upon their knees. Kneels. Come. Violent death, serve for Mandragora to make me sleep. Go tell my brothers, when I am laid out, they then may feed in quiet. They strangle her. Where's the waiting woman? Fetch her. Some other strangle the children. Enter Cariola. Look you, there sleeps your mistress. Oh, you are damned perpetually for this. My turn is next. It's not so ordered. Yes, and I'm glad you're so well prepared for it. You are deceived, sir. I am not prepared for it. I will not die. I will first come to my answer and know how I have offended. Come, dispatcher. You kept her counsel. Now you shall keep ours. I will not die. I must not. I am contracted to a young gentleman. Here's your wedding ring. Let me but speak with the duke. I'll discover treason to his person. Delays? Throttle her! She bites and scratches. If you kill me now, I am damned. I have not been at confession this two years. To executioners. When? I am quick with child. Why then? Your credit's saved. Executioners strangle. Cariola. Bear her into the next room. 
let these lie still exit the executioners with the body of cariola enter ferdinand is she dead she is what you'd have her but here begin your pity shows the children strangled alas how have these offended the death of young wolves is never to be pitied fix your eye here constantly do you not weep other sins only speak murder shrieks out the element of water moistens the earth but blood flies upwards and bedews the heavens cover her face mine eyes dazzle she died young i think not so her infelicity seemed to have years too many she and i were twins and i should die this instant i had lived her time to a minute it seems she was born first you have bloodily approved the ancient truth that kindred commonly do worse agree than remote strangers let me see her face again why didst not thou pity her what an excellent honest man mightst thou have been if thou hadst borne her to some sanctuary or bold in good cause opposed thyself with thy advanced sword above thy head between her innocence and my revenge i bade thee when i was distracted of my wits go kill my dearest friend and thou hast done t for let me but examine well the cause what was the meanness of her match to me only i must confess i had a hope had she continued widow to have gained an infinite mass of treasure by her death and that was the main cause her marriage that drew a stream of gall quite through my heart for thee as we observe in tragedies that a good actor many times is cursed for playing a villain's part i hate thee for it and for my sake say thou hast done much ill well let me quicken your memory for i perceive you are falling into ingratitude i challenge the reward due to my service i'll tell thee what i'll give thee do i'll give thee a pardon for this murder ha huh? yes and tis the largest bounty i can study to do thee by what authority didst thou execute this bloody sentence by yours mine was i her judge did any ceremonial form of law doom her to not being did a complete jury deliver her conviction up at the court where shalt thou find this judgment registered unless in hell see like a bloody fool thou hast forfeited thy life and thou shalt die for it the office of justice is perverted quite when one thief hangs another who shall dare to reveal this oh i'll tell thee the wolf shall find her grave and scrape it up not to devour the corpse but to discover the horrid murder you not i shall quake for it leave me i will first receive my pension you are a villain when your ingratitude is judged i am so oh horror that not the fear of him which binds the devils can prescribe man obedience never look upon me more why fare thee well your brother and yourself are worthy men you have a pair of hearts are hollow graves rotten and rotting others and your vengeance like two chained bullets still goes arm in arm you may be brothers for treason like the plague doth take much in a blood i stand like one that hath long ta'en a sweet and golden dream i am angry with myself now that i wake get thee into some unknown part of the world that i may never see thee let me know wherefore i should be thus neglected sir i served your tyranny and rather strove to satisfy yourself than all the world and though i loathed the evil yet i love you that did counsel it and rather sought to appear a true servant than an honest man i'll go hunt the badger by owl light tis a deed of darkness exit 
he's much distracted off my painted honour while with vain hopes our faculties we tire we seem to sweat in ice and freeze in fire what would i do were this to do again i would not change my peace of conscience for all the wealth of europe she stirs here's life return fair soul from darkness and lead mine out of this sensible hell she's warm she breathes upon thy pale lips i will melt my heart to store them with fresh colour who's there some cordial drink alas i dare not call so pity would destroy pity her eye opes and heaven and it seems to ope that late was shut to take me up to mercy antonio yes madam he is living the dead bodies you saw were but feigned statues he's reconciled to your brothers the pope hath wrought the atonement mercy dies oh she's gone again there the cords of life broke o oh, sacred innocence that sweetly sleeps on turtle's feathers whilst a guilty conscience is a black register wherein is writ all our good deeds and bad a perspective that shows us hell that we cannot be suffered to do good when we have a mind to it this is manly sorrow these tears i'm very certain never grew in my mother's milk my estate is sunk below the degree of fear where were these penitent fountains while she was living oh they were frozen up here is a sight as direful to my soul as is the sword unto a wretch hath slain his father come i'll bear thee hence and execute thy last will that's deliver thy body to the reverend dispose of some good women that the cruel tyrant shall not deny me then i'll post to milan where somewhat i will speedily enact worth my dejection exit with the body End of Act 4、Third、Act 5ENTER ANTONIO AND DELIO What think you of my hope of reconcilement to the Aragonian brethren? I misdoubt it. For though they have sent their letters of safe conduct for your repair to Milan, they appear but nets to entrap you. The Marquis of Pescara, under whom you hold certain land in cheat, much against his noble nature, hath been moved to seize those lands, and some of his dependents are at this instant making it their suit to be invested in your revenues. I cannot think they mean well to your life, that do deprive you of your means of life, your living. You are still an heretic to any safety I can shape myself. Here comes the Marquis. I will make myself petitioner for some part of your land, to know whither it is flying. I pray do. Withdraws. Enter Pascara. Sir, I have a suit to you. To me? An easy one. There is the citadel of St. Bennet, with some demeans, of late in the possession of Antonio Bologna. Please you bestow them on me. You are my friend, but this is such a suit, nor fit for me to give, nor you to take. No, sir. I will give you ample reason for it soon in private. Here's the cardinal's mistress. Enter Julia. My lord, I am grown your poor petitioner, and should be an ill beggar. Had I not a great man's letter here, the cardinal's, 
to court you in my favor. Gives a letter. He entreats for you the citadel of St. Bennet, that belonged to the banished Bologna. Yes. I could not have thought of a friend. I could rather pleasure with it. Tis yours. Sir, I thank you, and he shall know how doubly I am engaged, both in your gift and speediness of giving, which makes your grant the greater. Exit. How they fortify themselves with my ruin. Sir, I am little bound to you. Why? Because you denied this suit to me, and gave it to such a creature. Do you know what it was? It was Antonio's land, not forfeited by course of law, but ravished from his throat by the cardinal's entreaty. It were not fit I should bestow so main a piece of wrong upon my friend. Tis a gratification only due to a strumpet, for it is injustice. Shall I sprinkle the pure blood of innocence, to make those followers I call my friends look ruddier upon me? I am glad this land, ta'en from the owner by such wrong, returns again unto so foul an use as salary for his lust. Learn, good Delio, to ask noble things of me, and you shall find I'll be a noble giver. You instruct me well. Why, here's a man now would fright impudence from sauciest beggars. Prince Ferdinand's come to Milan, sick as they give out of an apoplexy. But some say tis a frenzy. I am going to visit him. Exit. Tis a noble old fellow. What course do you mean to take, Antonio? This night I mean to venture all my fortune, which is no more than a poor lingering life, to the cardinal's worst of malice. I have got private access to his chamber, and intend to visit him about the mid of night, as once his brother did our noble duchess. It may be that the sudden apprehension of danger, for I'll go in mine own shape, when he shall see it freight with love and duty, may draw the poison out of him, and work a friendly reconcilement. If it fail, yet it shall rid me of this infamous calling. For better fall once than be for ever falling. I'll second you in all danger, and howe'er, my life keeps rank with yours. You are still my loved and best friend. Exit. Scene two. Enter Pascara and Doctor. Now, Doctor, may I visit your patient? If it please your lordship, but he's instantly to take the air here in the gallery by my direction. Pray thee. What's his disease? A very pestilent disease, my lord. They call it lycanthropia. What's that? I need a dictionary to it. I'll tell you. In those that are possessed with it, there overflows such melancholy humour they imagine themselves to be transformed into wolves, steal forth to churchyards in the dead of night, and dig dead bodies up, as two nights since one met the duke about midnight in a lane behind St. Mark's Church, with the leg of a man upon his shoulder, and he howled fearfully, said he was a wolf, only the difference was a wolf's skin was hairy on the outside, his on the inside, bade them take their swords, rip up his flesh and try. Straight I was sent for, and, having ministered to him, found his grace very well recovered. I am glad, aunt. Yet not without some fear of a relapse. If he grow to his fit again, I'll go a nearer way to work with him than ever Paracelsus dreamt of. If they'll give me leave, I'll buffet his madness out of him. Stand aside, he comes. Enter Ferdinand, Cardinal, Malateste, and Basola. Leave me. Why doth your lordship love this solitariness? Eagles commonly fly alone. They are crows, daws, and starlings that flock together. Look, what's that follows me? Nothing, my lord. Yes. Tis your shadow. Stay it. Let it not haunt me. Impossible, if you move and the sun shine. I will throttle it. Throws himself down on his shadow. Oh, my lord, you are angry with nothing. You are a fool. How is possible I should catch my shadow, unless I fall upon't? When I go to hell, 
I mean to carry a bribe, for, look you, good gifts evermore make way for the worst persons. Rise, good my lord. I am studying the art of patience. Tis a noble virtue. To drive six snails before me from this town to Moscow. Neither use goad nor whip to them, but let them take their own time. The patientest man in the world match me for an experiment, and I'll crawl after like a sheep biter. Force him up. They res him. Use me well, you were best. What I have done, I have done. I'll confess nothing. Now let me come to him. Are you mad, my lord? Are you out of your princely wits? What's he? Your doctor. Let me have his beard sawed off and his eyebrows filed more civil. I must do mad tricks with him, for that's the only way on't. I have brought your grace a salamander's skin to keep you from sunburning. I have cruel sore eyes. The white of a cockatrix's egg is present remedy. Let it be new laid one, you are best. Hide me from him. Physicians are like kings, they brook no contradiction. Now he begins to fear me. Now let me alone with him. How oh, now? Put off your gown. Let me have some forty urinals filled with rose water. He and I'll go pelt one another with them. Now he begins to fear me. Can you fetch a frisk, sir? Let him go, let him go upon my peril. I find by his eye he stands in awe of me. I'll make him as tame as a dormouse. Can you fetch your frisk, sir? I will stamp him into a collis, flay off his skin to cover one of the anatomies this rogue has set in the cold yonder in Barbara Sherugin's hall. Heads! Heads! You are all of you like beasts for sacrifice. Throws the doctor down and beats him. There's nothing left of you but tongue and belly, flattery and lechery. Exit. Doctor, he did not fear you uh, thoroughly. True, I was somewhat too forward. Mercy upon me. What a fatal judgment hath fallen upon this Ferdinand. Knows your grace what accident hath brought unto the prince this strange distraction? Sighed. I must feign somewhat. Thus they say it grew. You have heard it rumoured for these many years. None of our family dies, but there is seen the shape of an old woman, which is given by tradition to us to have been murdered by her nephews for her riches. Such a figure one night, as the prince sat up late at his book, appeared to him. When crying out for help, the gentleman of his chamber found his grace all in a cold sweat, altered much in face and language. Since which apparition, he hath grown worse and worse, and I much fear he cannot live. Sir, I would speak with you. We'll leave your grace, wishing to the sick prince our noble lord all health of mind and body you are most welcome exeunt pascara malateste and doctor are you come so aside this fellow must not know by any means i had intelligence in our duchess's death for though i counselled it the full of the engagement seemed to grow from ferdinand now sir how fares our sister i do not think but sorrow makes her look like to an oft-dyed garment she shall not take comfort from me why do you look so wildly Oh, the fortune of your master here, the prince dejects you. But be you of happy comfort, if you do one thing for me, I'll entreat. Though he had a cold tombstone o'er his bones, I'd make you what you would be. Anything. Give it me in a breath, and let me fly to it. They that think long, small expedition win. For musing much of an end, cannot begin. Enter Julia. Sir, will you come in to supper? I am busy. Leave me. Aside. What an excellent shape hath that fellow. Exit. Tis thus. Antonio lurks here in Milan. Inquire him out and kill him. While he lives, our sister cannot marry, and I have thought of an excellent match for her. Do this, and style me thy advancement. But by what means shall I find him out? There is a gentleman called Delio here in the camp that hath long one approved his loyal friend. Set eye upon that fellow. Follow him to Mass, maybe Antonio, although he do account religion but a school name, for fashion of the world, may accompany him. Or else go inquire out Delio's confessor, and see if you can bribe him to reveal it. That there are a thousand ways a man might find to trace him. As to know what fellow haunts the Jews for taking up great sums of money, for sure he's in want. 
Or else go to the picture makers and learn who brought her picture lately. Some of these happily may take. Well, I'll not freeze in the business. I would see that wretched thing, Antonio, above all sights in the world. Do, and be happy. Excellent. This fellow doth breed basilisks in his eyes. He's nothing else but murder. Yet he seems not to have notice of the Duchess's death. Tis his cunning. I must follow his example. There cannot be a surer way to trace than that of an old fox. Re-enter Julia with a pistol. So, sir, you are well met. How now? Nay, the doors are fast enough. Now, sir, I will make you confess your treachery. Treachery? Yes. Confess to me which of my women t'was you hired to put love-powder into my drink. Love-powder? Yes, when I was at Malfi. Why should I fall in love with such a face else? I have already suffered for thee so much pain. The only remedy to do me good is to kill my longing. Sure, your pistol holds nothing but perfumes or kissing comfits. Excellent lady, you have a pretty way on to discover your longing. Come, come, I'll disarm you and arm you thus. Yet this is wondrous strange. Compare thy form and my eyes together. You'll find my love no such great miracle. Now you say I am wanting. This nice modesty in ladies is but a troublesome familiar that haunts them. Know you me? I am a blunt soldier. The better. Sure there wants fire where there are no lively sparks of roughness. And I want compliment. Why, ignorance in courtship cannot make you do amiss, if you have a heart to do well. You're very fair. Nay, if you lay beauty to my charge, I must plead unguilty. Your bright eyes carry a quiver of darts in them sharper than sunbeams. You will mar me with commendation. Put yourself to the charge of courting me, whereas now I woo you. Aside. I have it. I will work upon this creature. Let us grow most amorously familiar. If the great cardinal now should see me thus, would he not count me a villain? No, he might count me a wanton, not lay a scruple of offence on you. For if I see and steal a diamond, the fault is not in the stone, but in me, the thief that purloins it. I am sudden with you. We that are great women of pleasure used to cut off these uncertain wishes and unquiet longings and in an instant join the sweet delight and the pretty excuse together. Had you been at the street, under my chamber window, even there I should have courted you. Oh, you are an excellent lady. Bid me do somewhat for you presently, to express I love you. I will, and if you love me, fail not to effect it. The cardinal is grown wondrous melancholy. Demand the cause. Let him not put you off with feigned excuse. Discover the main ground on it. Why would you know this? I have depended on him, and I hear that he is fallen in some disgrace with the Emperor. If he be, like the mice that forsake falling houses, I would shift to other dependents. You shall not need follow the wars. I'll be your maintenance. And I your loyal servant. But I cannot leave my calling. Not leave an ungrateful general for the love of a sweet lady? You are like some cannot sleep in feather beds, but must have blocks for their pillows. Will you do this? Cunningly. Tomorrow I'll expect the intelligence. Tomorrow. Get you into my cabinet. You shall have it with you. Do not delay me no more than I do you. I am like one that is condemned. I have my pardon promised, but I would see it sealed. Go, get you in. You shall see me wind my tongue about his heart like a skein of silk. Exit Basola. Re-enter Cardinal. Where are you? Enter servants. Here. Let none, upon your lives, have conference with the Prince Ferdinand. 
unless I know it. Aside. In this distraction, he may reveal the murder. Excellent servants. Beyond my lingering consumption, I am weary of her, and by any means will be quit of. How now, my lord? What ails you? Nothing. Oh, you are much altered. Come, I must be your secretary, and remove this lead from off your bosom. What's the matter? I may not tell you. Are you so far in love with sorrow you cannot part with part of it? Or think you I cannot love your grace when you are sad as well as merry? Or do you suspect I that have been a secret to your heart these many winters cannot be the same unto your tongue? Satisfy thy longing. The only way to make thee keep my counsel, and not to tell thee. Tell your echo this, or flatterers that like echoes still report what they hear, though most imperfect, and not me. For if that you be true unto yourself, I'll know. Will you rack me? No. Judgment shall draw it from you. It is an equal fault to tell one's secrets unto all or none. The first argues folly. But the last, tyranny. Very well. Why, imagine that I have committed some secret deed which I desire the world may never hear of. Therefore may not I know it. You have concealed from me as great a sin as adultery. Sir, never was occasion for perfect trial of my constancy till now. Sir, I beseech you. You'll repent it. Never. It hurries thee to ruin. I not tell thee. Be well advised, and think what danger it is to receive a prince's secrets. They that do had need have their breasts hoof with adamant to contain them, I pray thee. Yet be satisfied. Examine thy own frailty. Tis more easy to tie knots than unloose them. Tis a secret that... Like a lingering poison may chance a lie, spread in thy veins, and kill thee seven years hence. Now you dally with me. No more. Thou shalt know it. By my appointment, the great Duchess of Malfi and two of her young children, four nights since, were strangled. Oh, heaven! Sir, what have you done? How now? How settles this? Think you your bosom will be a grave dark and obscure enough for such a secret? You have undone yourself, sir. Why? It lies not in me to conceal it. No? Come, I will swear you to it upon this book. Most religiously. Kiss it. She kisses the book. Now you shall never utter it. Thy curiosity hath undone thee. Thou art poisoned with that book. Because I knew thou couldst not keep my counsel, I have bound thee to it by death. Reander Basola for pity's sake, hold! <gasps> Basil! I forgive you this equal piece of justice you have done. For I betrayed your counsel to that fellow. He overheard it. That was the cause I said it lay not in me to conceal it. Oh, foolish woman! Couldst not thou have poisoned him? Tis weakness. Too much to think what should have been done. I go. I know not whither dies. Wherefore comest thou hither? That I might find a great man like yourself, not out of his wits, as the Lord Ferdinand, to remember my service. I'll have thee hewed in pieces. Make not yourself such a promise of that life which is not yours to dispose of. Who placed thee here? Her lust, as she intended. Very well. Now you know me for your fellow murderer. And wherefore should you lay fair marble colours upon your rotten purposes to me? Unless you imitate some that do plot great treasons, and when they have done, go hide themselves in the grave of those who are actors in it. No more. There is a fortune attends thee. Shall I go sue to fortune any longer? Tis the fool's pilgrimage. I have honours in store for thee. There are a many ways that conduct to seeming honour and some of them very dirty ones. Throw to the devil thy melancholy! The fire burns well! What need we keep a stirring oft, and make a greater smother? Thou wilt kill Antonio? Yes. Take up that body. I think I shall shortly grow the common beer for churchyards. I will allow thee some dozen of attendants to aid thee in the murder. Oh, by no means. Physicians that apply horse leeches to any rank swelling use to cut off their tails, that the blood may run through them the faster. 
let me have no train when I go to shed blood, lest it make me have a greater when I ride to the gallows. Come to me after midnight, to help to remove that body to her own lodging. I'll give out that she died of the plague, it will breathe the less inquiry after her death. Where's Castruccio, her husband? He wrote to Naples to take possession of Antonio's citadel. Believe me, you have done a very happy turn. Fail not to come. There is the master key of our lodging, and by that you may conceive what trust I plant in you. You shall find me ready. Exit, Cardinal. Oh, poor Antonio. Though nothing be so needful to thy estate as pity, yet I find nothing so dangerous. I must look to my footing. In such slippery ice pavements, men had need to be frost-nailed well when they break their necks else. The precedents here afford me. How this man bears up in blood seems fearless. Why, it is well. Security, some men call, the suburbs of hell, only a dead wall between. Well, good Antonio, I'll seek thee out, and all my care shall be to put thee into safety from the reach of these most cruel biters that have got some of thy blood already. It may be I'll join with thee in a most just revenge. The weakest arm is strong enough that strikes with the sword of justice. Stormy thinks the Duchess haunts me. <laughs> there, there, it is nothing but my melancholy. O oh, penitence, let me truly taste of thy cup that throws men down only to raise them up. Exit. Scene three. Enter Antonio and Delio. Echo from the Duchess's grave. Yon's the Cardinal's window. This fortification grew from the ruins of an ancient abbey, and to yon side of the river lies a wall, a piece of a cloister, which in my opinion gives the best echo that you ever heard, so hollow and so dismal, and withal so plain in the distinction of our words, that many have supposed it is a spirit that answers. I do love these ancient ruins. We never tread upon them, but we set our foot upon some reverend history. And questionless, here in this open court, which now lies naked to the injuries of stormy weather, some men lie interred, loved the church so well, and gave so largely to it, they thought it should have canopied their bones till doomsday. But all things have their end. Churches and cities, which have diseases like to men, must have like death that we have. Like death that we have. Now the echo hath caught you. It groaned, methought, and gave a very deadly accent. Deadly accent. I told you it was a pretty one. You may make it a huntsman, or a falconer, a musician, or a thing of sorrow. A thing of sorrow. Ay, sure, that suits it best. That suits it best. Tis very like my wife's voice. Ay, wife's voice. Come, let us walk further from it. I would not have you go to the cardinals to-night. Do not. Do not. Wisdom doth not more moderate wasting sorrow than time. Take time for it. Be mindful of thy safety. Be mindful of thy safety. Necessity compels me. Make scrutiny through the passages of your own life. You'll find it impossible to fly your fate. Oh, fly your fate. Hark, the dead stones seem to have pity on you, and give you good counsel. Echo, I will not talk with thee, for thou art a dead thing. Thou art a dead thing. My duchess is asleep now, and her little ones, I hope sweetly. Oh, heaven, shall I never see her more? Never see her more. I marked not one repetition of the echo but that, and on the sudden a clear light presented me a face folded in sorrow. Your fancy merely. Come, I'll be out of this ague, for to live thus is not indeed to live. It is a mockery and abuse of life. I will not henceforth save myself by halves. Lose all, or nothing. Your own virtue save you. I'll fetch your eldest son and second you. It may be that the sight of his own blood, spread in so sweet a figure, may beget the more compassion. However, fare you well. 
though in our miseries fortune have a part, yet in our noble sufferings she hath none. Contempt of pain, that we may call our own. Exit. Scene four. Enter Cardinal Pescara, Malateste, Rodrigo, and Grisolan. You shall not watch tonight by the sick prince. His grace is very well recovered. Good, my lord, suffer us. Oh, by no means. The noise and change of object in his eye doth more distract him. I pray all to bed. And though you hear him in his violent fit, do not rise, I entreat you. So, sir, we shall not. Nay, I must have you promise, upon your honours, for I was enjoined to it by himself, and he seemed to urge it sensibly. Let our honours bind this trifle. Nor any of your followers. Neither. It may be to make trial of your promise, when he's asleep, myself will rise and feign some of his mad tricks, and cry out for help, and feign myself in danger. If your throat were cutting, I'd not come at you, now I have protested against it. Why, I thank you. Twas a foul storm to-night. The Lord Ferdinand's chamber shook like an osier. Twas nothing but pure kindness in the devil to rock his own child. Exit all except the cardinal. The reason why I do not suffer these, thought my brother, is because at midnight I may with better privacy convey Julia's body to her own lodging. My conscience! I would pray now, but the devil takes away my heart for having any confidence in prayer. About this hour I appointed Boswell to fetch the body. When he hath served my turn, he dies. Exit. Enter Basola. <gasps> "'Twas the cardinal's voice. I heard him name Bossola and my death. Listen, I hear one's footing. Enter Ferdinand. Strangling is a very quiet death. Aside. Nay, then I see I must stand upon my guard. What say to that? Whisper softly. Do you agree to it? So, it must be done in the dark. The cardinal would not for a thousand pounds the doctor should see it. Exit. My death is plotted. Here's the consequence of murder. We value not desert nor Christian breath when we know black deeds must be cured with death. Enter Antonio and servant. Here, stay, sir, and be confident, I pray. I'll fetch you a dark lantern. Exit. Could I take him at his prayers? There were hope of pardon. Full right, my sword. <sighs> Stabs him. I'll not give thee so much leisure as to pray. Oh, oh, I am gone. Thou hast ended a long suit in a minute. What art thou? A most wretched thing, that only have thy benefit in death to appear myself. Read her servant with a lantern. Where are you, sir? Very near my home. Bosola. O oh, misfortune! Smother thy pity, thou art dead else. Antonio? The man I would have saved above my own life? We are merely the star's tennis balls, struck and banded which way please them. O oh, good Antonio, I'll whisper one thing in thy dying ear shall make thy heart break quickly thy fair duchess and two sweet children their very names kindle a little life in me are murdered some men have wished to die at the hearing of sad tidings i am glad that i shall do it in sadness i would not now wish my wounds balmed nor healed for I have no use to put my life to. In all our quest of greatness, like wanton boys whose pastime is their care, we follow after bubbles blown in the air. Pleasure of life, what is't? Only the good hours of an ague. Merely a preparative to rest, to endure vexation. I do not ask the process of my death. Only commend me to Dalio. Break, heart. And let my son fly the courts of princes. Dies. Thou seemst to have loved Antonio. 
I brought him hither to have reconciled him to the cardinal. I do not ask thee that. Take him up, if thou tender thine own life, and bear him where the Lady Julia was wont to lodge. Oh, my fate moves swift. I'll have this cardinal in the forge already. Now I'll bring him to the hammer. Oh, direful misprision! I will not imitate things glorious, no more than base. I'll be mine own example. On, on, and look thou represent for silence the thing thou bearest. Exit. Scene five. Enter Cardinal with a book. I am puzzled in a question about hell. He says, in hell there's one material fire, and yet it shall not burn all men alike. Lay him by. How tedious is a guilty conscience. When I look into the fish ponds in my garden, methinks I see a thing armed with a rake that seems to strike at me. Enter Basola and servant bearing Antonio's body. Now art thou come? Thou lookst ghastly. There sits in thy face some great determination mixed with some fear. Thus it lightens into action. I am come to kill thee. Ha! Help! Our guard! Thou art deceived. They are out of thy howling. Hold, and I will faithfully divide revenues with thee. Thy prayers and proffers are both unseasonable. Raise the watch. We are betrayed. I have confined your flight. I'll suffer your retreat to Julia's chamber, but no further. Help! We are betrayed. Enter above Pescara, Malateste, Rodrigo, and Grisolan. Listen. I duked him for rescue. Fie upon his counterfeiting. Why, tis not the cardinal. Yes, yes, tis he. But I'll see him hanged, ere I'll go down to him. Here's a plot upon me. I'm assaulted. I am lost. Unless some rescue. He doth this pretty well, but it will not serve to laugh me out of mine honour. The sword's at my throat! You would not bawl so loud then. Come, come, let's go to bed. He told us this much aforehand. He wished you should not come at him, but... Believed, the accent of the voice sounds not in jest. I'll down to him howsoever, and with engines force open the doors. Exit above. Let's follow him aloof, and note how the cardinal will laugh at him. Exit above, Malateste, Rodrigo, and Grisolan. There's for you first, cause you shall not unbarricade the door to let in rescue. Kills the servant. What cause hast thou to pursue my life? Look there. Antonio. Slain by my hand unwittingly. Pray and be sudden. When thou killedst thy sister, thou tookst from justice her most equal balance, and left her naught but her sword. Oh, mercy! Now it seems thy greatness was only outward, for thou fallst faster of thyself than calamity can drive thee. I'll not waste longer time. There! Stabs him. Thou hast hurt me! Again! Shall I die like a leveret without any resistance? Help! 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 I am slain! Enter Ferdinand. The alarm! Give me a fresh horse! Rally the vaunt guard or the day is lost! Yield! Yield! I give you the honors of arms! Shake my sword over you! Will you yield? <coughs> Help me! I am your brother! The devil! My brother, fight upon the adverse party! He wounds the cardinal, and, in the scuffle, gives Basola his death wound. There flies your ransom! <coughs> oh, justice! I suffer now for what hath former been. Sorrow is held in the eldest child of sin. Now you're brave fellows. Caesar's fortune was harder than Pompey's. Caesar died in the arms of prosperity, Pompey at the feet of disgrace. You both died in the field. The pain's nothing. Pain many times taken away with the apprehension of greater, as the toothache with the sight of a barber that comes to pull it out. <laughs> There's philosophy for you. Now my revenge is perfect. Sink, thou main cause of my undoing. Kills Ferdinand. The last part of my life hath done thee best service. Give me some wet hay. 
I'm broken winded. I do account this world but a dog kennel. I will vaunt credit and affect high pleasures beyond death. He seems to come to himself now he's so near the bottom. My sister, oh, my sister, there's the cause on't. Whether we fall by ambition, blood, or lust, like diamonds we are cut with our own dust. Dies. Thou hast thy payment, too. Yes, I hold my weary soul in my teeth. Tis ready to part from me. I do glory that thou, which stoodst like a huge pyramid begun upon a large and ample base, shall end in a little point, a kind of nothing. Enter below. Pascara, Malateste, Rodrigo, and Grisolan. How oh, no, my lord? Oh, sad disaster. How comes this? Revenge for the Duchess of Malfi, murdered by the Aragonian brethren. For Antonio, slain by this hand. For lustful Julia, poisoned by this man. And lastly, for myself, that was an actor in the main of all, much against mine own good nature, yet in the end neglected. How now, my lord? Look to my brother. He gave us these large wounds, as we were struggling here in the rushes. And now... I pray, let me be laid by and never thought of. Dies. How fatally it seems he did withstand his own rescue. Thou wretched thing of blood! How came Antonio by his death? In a mist. I know not how. Such a mistake as I have often seen in a play. Oh, I am gone. We are only like dead walls or vaulted graves that ruined yield no echo. Fare you well. It may be pain but no harm to me to die in so good a quarrel. Oh, this gloomy world! In what a shadow or deep pit of darkness doth womanish and fearful mankind live. Let worthy minds ne'er stagger in distrust to suffer death or shame for what is just. Mine is another wretch. Dies. The noble Delio, as I came to the palace, told me of Antonio's being here, and showed me a pretty gentleman, his son and heir. Enter Delio, and Antonio's son. Oh, sir, you come too late. I heard so, and was armed for it ere I came. Let us make noble use of this great ruin, and join all our force to establish this young, hopeful gentleman in his mother's right. These wretched eminent things leave no more fame behind them than should one fall in a frost and leave his print in snow. As soon as the sun shines, it ever melts, both form and matter. I have ever thought nature doth nothing so great for great men as when she is pleased to make them lords of truth. Integrity of life is fame's best friend, which nobly, beyond death, shall crown the end. Excellent. End of Act 5 End of The Duchess of Malfi by John Webster